What's happening, weirdos? This is a very special Friday bonus episode of You Made It Weird. Normally on Friday, we do me and Val. We call it We Made It Weird. This Friday, we have a very special guest with us. I watched some videos of this dude on YouTube talking about being dead for 11 minutes, and I was jaw on the floor, fascinated. I reached out, and you are about to hear the first You Made It Weird guest who's ever been dead. We talk about near-death experiences. We talk a lot about psychedelics. We talk about what he learned from his experience and how he's applying that in his life. He's fascinating. He's thoughtful. He's Adam Tapp. I'm so glad you guys are here for this bonus Friday episode. Val and I will be back next week, but I know if you're anything like me, if you're interested in the things that I'm interested in, you are about to lose your mind. He is incredible. This is a one in a billion story. And I'm so happy that you're here to share it with all of us. Just a couple things to plug up top. It's all on PeteHolmes.com. I'm coming to Florida, coming to Chicago. Uh, A couple other things on there. Go to PeteHolmes.com. May the 4th, I'm doing a big show here in Los Angeles for the Netflix is a Joke Fest. Hope people can come to that on Star Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And I'm selling the last remaining copies of my vinyl, Dirty Clean, on vinyl, Very few are left, and all of the proceeds are going to support Homeboy Industries, which is a uh, cause that I care for very, very deeply. And that's it. That's everything, guys. I'm so glad you're here. This is such a cool and interesting way to spend your time. Thank you for for your trust. I think you're going to enjoy it. Let's get into it. I was like, at least I emailed you this morning with the wrong time, Uh, but it was the wrong time. But here we are. Is this an okay time? Yeah. No, honestly, I I I fuck up time zones constantly. So it is what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I'm constantly interacting with people in like Thailand and Germany and here and there. And I'm you know, especially when you have like a 14 hour time difference or something. Yeah. And you're having to go back and I Tuesday morning is a Wednesday night or some nonsense. And it's yeah. Well, that that's interesting, man. First of all. That kind of leads to my first question for you, but I just want to say thank you uh, so much. I, I watched your story. Um, I was really moved by it. I think it's it must be a, a remarkable thing to offer such insight and, and comfort and, and joy to people over one of the most vital, distracting, ever-present, um, anxiety-inducing weights that we're all carrying and none of us are talking about yeah you know what i mean like it's it's that existential notion of non-existence in oneself you know what i mean like what the biological processes and experience that give rise to the intricate being that is adam will cease to exist and what does that mean to me yes Um, i just started reading the denial of death uh which everybody seems to have read and i'm grooving with it but i'm i'm a i'm a really spiritual person so i don't have I don't want to flatter myself and say I don't have as much uh, denial of death. Like I think about it a lot. I talk about it a lot. But there are moments where like, you know what it is, man, is like sometimes I'm in a good mood. You ever, you ever, you ever think about this? Like <laughs> I'm in a good mood. My needs are met. Uh, I've had coffee. Uh, I'm not even trying to be funny. Like I've had a coffee. I've seen my daughter. I there's I've gotten some sunlight and I'm like, it's okay. We are eternal. It, we're all just awareness. It can't go anywhere. It's never really been anywhere. It's all just kind of like a play. It's all just a dance. And, you know, there's that thing in, uh, I think it's Chinese Zen, that it's like, we're like a vase. And when you break the vase, the air in the vase just kind of merges with mm-hmm. the air around it. Or another comforting image is is that I believe in, is we're like waves. We're like momentary appearances of the ocean. Like the ocean appears to be a wave, appears to be Adam, appears to be Pete. And then it kind of sizzles out and Proceeds. gets pulled back yeah. in. But nothing happened to water. Nothing happens to awareness. It's okay. It kind of unravels at death. But well, let me put this to yeah. you real quick. When I'm in a bad mood, I'm like, ah, fuck, I'm going to die. Like, it, it all <laughs> yeah. kind of goes away sometimes. Well, and, and you can have stories and allegories and metaphors and all these different things to put it into a way that is, I don't want to say pacifying or, or less fearful. Yeah, yeah. But we're also 
kind of working against a biological constructed evolutionary process, which makes me need to want to be alive. Buddy. Fuck you it. know what I mean? Like, Thank you. You're already a great yeah. guest because we need to like this. Is, my wife would say the same thing. Your body is firing off panic because that's how we yeah, got man. here. That's how there we got self-preservation. <laughs> you know, like you, you can look at the Serengeti and say that gazelle who didn't really give a shit. Yeah. And was sort of strained and didn't jump when everyone yeah. else did. They, they died. They Play and grab ass. Or whatever. Nibble, yeah. yeah. Nibbling clovers, real casual. That one didn't make it. And you and I are the result of a lot of panicked, high-shouldered, yeah. nervous <laughs> Nellies. Yeah. And honestly, you know, as I'm raising a daughter, I'm really careful to not teach her to be fearful, but I'm also like, don't go in the street, <laughs> you know? Well, it's, dude, like, I, how old's your daughter, man? She's five. Yeah, I got like a two and a half year old daughter. Oh wow, you're right in it. I love it. Yeah, and and I know what you mean. And it's and again too, right? Like, there's no such thing as black and white. Everything is this profoundly complicated sea of gray. And yeah. and moving too far in any direction is just a lack of balance. And and you're absolutely right. Uh -huh. I don't want my kid to live in this perpetual state of fear and worried about every single person thing around them. But there does have to be some sense of fear. And then figuring out where to place emphasis on that is different mm. for each child, different for each circumstance. It's, well, you know, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to say it's super easy to fuck up a kid and incredibly, incredibly difficult to find the nuances, the timing, the appropriateness, the tone of voice. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's that's one thing that I've been picking up on is like, oh man, it's every yeah. opportunity could be missed. It's intense. Yes. And again, I'm hearing my wife's voice being like, we don't have to be perfect. It's not a test. And and there is, there are big things that imprint, but there's like a lot of million, like a million little things. And you get that ratio leaning towards the good. I think you'll be okay. And the fact, here's, here's what I always <laughs> say to comfort myself as a parent. The fact that you're thinking about it and trying like chef's kiss, like yeah, being and, conscious right? about it and, yeah. and going like, oh, I fucked up. I'm sorry. I, I'm excited to talk to you, but I'm like, I apologize to my daughter all the time. And, and, and you know what else I say to my daughter all the time is I go, I was wrong. And it feels so good. Me too. Dude, yeah. funny that you say that because like, I'm constantly, I'm like, Hey, I'm sorry, sweetheart. Daddy made a mistake or I'm sorry I did this because as opposed to that weird, interesting stereotype of that, you know, a parent can never be wrong. A parent has to be this absolute authority. And I'm like, yeah, but that's, that's not reflective of reality. That's no. not reflective of adulthood. It's not reflective no. of anything other no. than a weird perpetuated stereotype. Yes. Like we're and, generals in the army and we have to be like, oh, that's hot, hot, hot. and I'm like, yeah. that's, why wait until like as grownups, people sometimes say, you know, we had a kid and they're like, does that help you understand your parents? And I'm like, why wait until then? Let's just have that oh, be a no. part of the conversation. Be like, dad, it doesn't know. Like death is, is a good one. And you know, we don't have to talk about death the whole time, but obviously you are a type of expert, which is super exciting. But like, you know, we live in a place where sometimes we'll find a dead bird. There was a dead mouse in the pool the other day. And I catch myself going like, what do I say? I don't know is is always a great choice. Like, I, I don't know. And, and you know about uh, transverbal things. Like, we can't even really talk about it. And it's yeah. it's a beautiful thing to just say. Here's a good one. I'll put it to you. I don't know, but we can trust it. That's a good one. Like, I don't well, know, see, but it's yeah. safe. <laughs> like, it's like, okay. And again, you know, it's it's one thing that I always talks about with my wife about our daughter is like, it's it's okay not to know. It's, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. it's exactly as you just stated. It's, it's okay not to be an authoritative figure. It's okay not to know. Mm. And at the best we can do is just have our own self-awareness because mm. we are the adults. Yes. And yeah. when she's screaming in your face about her backpack or a cookie or something, and you're just like, okay, fair enough. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm right. the adult in this scenario. So yeah. I need to curb my behavior to adapt there's, to this scenario. There's so many bowls of your own feelings, I find as a parent, that you just have to eat. Like oh, yeah. you, you're having this, like, this is someone's like screaming at me, like you said, about a cookie. <laughs> yeah. And you just want to like, activate like 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 a transformer you want to go from the car to the big robot and be like this will not stand and like <laughs> shut it know. down and you just eat it but what i'm finding i don't know if you run into this then like 
I was talking to my friend, uh, Greg Fitzsimmons, who, who, who sometimes rages out. And I loved having a friend, or he used to, who's had anger issues. And I wouldn't say I have anger issues, but I'm very uncomfortable with my anger. And sometimes I'll spend a weekend with my daughter. And then we were coming home and like the gate started closing on the car. And I like was like, yeah, fuck! like like that, like it just, <laughs> yeah. like came out. But then yeah. my, my wife says it's all about the repair, right? Like it's not about never snapping at a gate. But I just go like, yeah, dad, it, that was scary. Like I'm like that, just naming it and saying like, that was weird for me as well. And then the next day I'm even bringing it up. I'm like, remember when dad yelled? And she was like, you screamed. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Remember when dad screamed? And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry about that. If that was scary. And she goes, I liked it. And I was like, this is safe. Like, let's, let's be a family yeah. that can feel all the feelings. But I do want to put this to you when, when the, we found the dead mouse or we buried the dead bird. Again, it's not about being right, but I would like my child and I'd like everybody to have some sort of framework for death, like somewhere to put it in their desk that makes it a little bit more mentionable and a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. And I just go like, it the bird where'd the bird go? It went back to the great life. It's It's got kind of like a Native American flavor, but it, it goes yeah. back to, it goes back. Sometimes I'll be like, before you were born, you were in the great life. And when you die, you go back to the great life. And dude, it's so funny how, as much as I've studied Eastern philosophy and religion and all these things, and as many psychedelics as I've done, I kind of come back to this idea that I'm like, you know, the idea of heaven isn't perfect. Like we're all on a cloud in robes, but I'm also like, yeah, that's, 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 that's close enough. Like when you say like, everybody is there yeah. and I want you to talk about this. Everybody's there because every potential is there. Does that make sense? There's no, there's no separation, but it, yeah, like, like I smoked NNDMT and I was like, yeah, my daughter was there. And that's also the funniest thing you could say. Isn't it though? You're also yeah. just like, that's a hilarious joke. If, if you smoke NNDMT and go into that place and then go, was your wife there? You just laugh to tears that you're like, everything that's ever been or could be was Is there present. at the same time. Yeah. And it was there and it wasn't there and it was full and it was empty and it was cold and it was warm. It was every potential. And I'll, but here's, I'll, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, but it was safe. Like you can trust yeah. it. And that to me is the, is the job of, of some relationship to God is to, is to stoke the fire of trust. Now I'm going to put it to you because you died. <laughs> <laughs> You died. You talk <laughs> about it. I just smoked a drug. You died. <laughs> well, and and it and it's funny too. Like you know, I I've had so many conversations about this. No, about, I know. You know I, I feel bad to... making you talk about it again. No, no, but, dude. I, I'm I'm just saying for the reference of how yeah. people interpret and and it's funny that there's so many purists who are like, you know, a near death experience has nothing to do with psychedelics, and I'm like. But it does, you yeah. know, and, and there's and there's actually research now where this isn't so anecdotal as it used to be. Like Michigan mm. University has done research that shows that we have equatable amounts of NN dimethyltryptamine present in our brain at any given time as serotonin and dopamine. Yes. Those are wow. two very powerful neurotransmitters that regulate mood, digestion, pleasure receptors, some degree movement. And yeah. this is present in, in equatable amounts. And that when inducing cardiac arrest in rats, if you're dialysizing the cerebral one fluid, you're also seeing six-fold, ten-fold elevations of dimethyltryptamine in as a neurotransmitter. Most people that listen to this know. I said I smoked five meo, right? That that's the one that I smoked. I, I just want to make sure I got the right one. Oh, I thought you said NNDM. I did. I think I did. I did five meo. Probably both. Yeah, five meo is insane. I did five meo. I think NN is insane. I'm a little scared to do NN, so I, I, I want to talk to you about that. But Usually uh, it's the opposite. That's an interesting statement. Most people I, are willing because NN DMT is, is sort of a projection of like 580p into this multidimensional space where you're interacting with things. And more often than not, you maintain an identity and a sense of spatial awareness, mm. even though you're, you're not in this reality. Mm. Whereas 5-MeO DMT, as I, I would imagine your experience was, is a dissolution of self and a dissolution of the boundaries that you have surrounding you keeping in the ideas yeah. and thoughts of yeah. adam or pete yeah 
And it's I, and you go no, ahead. I was just going to say, like those, the idea of a dissolution of self for most people is profoundly terrifying, much the same way that <laughs> death is, and that's why I put those two things sort of in a similar category. That's interesting. Like, well, yeah. you're absolutely you're absolutely right. You, it's like you're a dollop of paint, and and a finger goes in you and then smears you. Like you just and yeah. then and then after a while, there's no paint on the finger, and the finger's still going. Is is one way to think about it. But the the comfort I remember right before I I smoked it, I went, "You'll be back." Like my consciousness, my whatever you want to call it, truest Pete said to Pete the personality, Pete the memories, Pete the likes and dislikes. He was scared and higher yeah. functioning Pete said, you'll be back. And, and that was enough for him. I was like, we're going away. You'll be back like that. Like what? Yeah, a great... we're, we're temporarily shutting down the factory and you, don't yes. worry. Yeah. And we're dude, all going to come back to work tomorrow. Look at it as a vacation. Aren't you fucking tired of being Pete all the time? And I was like, we're just going on a 15 minute of course, it's timeless, but like a break. And the mantra that I had was, you'll be back. And I trust myself, mean, Ooh, capital yeah. S self. I was like, I yeah. trust myself, meaning I am it. And it is in charge. And I'm going into it. I'm going into myself. And that was very much my experience was it was very much like sucking back into my into what I always was not going out to something else, but like yeah. retreating back into what I so always deep into was. oneself that you go back to the source of whatever consciousness, whatever existence, truth. and that's you. So it's not as foreign. Mm -hmm. It's not God on a throne a million light years away. It was there. It's it's the Wizard of Oz, and you were there, and you were there. It was, and I was there. <laughs> you were there the whole time. Alan Watts has that thing about like at the end of our lives, we go back and take our masks off and go backstage and laugh. And I was like, that's what it felt like as I was like, I thought I was going on this far off journey. And the journey that I feel like we're called to go on is actually to go to the closest place you've ever been. Like it's to, it's to remove the distractions that are keeping you from experiencing something that makes your skin seem far away. Like it's like your skin seems so close, but it's even closer than that. As I say a million times, it's looking out your eyes. Like that's how close it is. And then you go into that. We're, we're all over the place because I'm very excited talking, <laughs> talking to you. Both. No, 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 it's okay, man. I, I'm going to spread a conversation. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> well, you were saying that when you give dialysis to, to, to rats, uh, they, it triggers NNDMT and NNDMT Go ahead. So what there's, there's a little bit more to it that the two is that 5-MeO-DMT or 5-methyloxidine-methyltryptamine is also present in your brain. It's just it the lesser. Oh, God, yeah. Like it's it's manufactured. It's it's also found in your urine and blood and in your brain. It's just one of those things where 5-MeO-DMT, up until really Mike Tyson started talking about it, was relatively unknown. Like it, it was a very, very nuanced, obscure, esoteric psychedelic. Yeah. And, you know, NNDMT you know, you, you can go back to the 60s and, you know, it was first synthesized in in Canada and it was identified and isolated in Japan. And there's a bunch of research has been done on it in books, hmm. but 5-MeO-DMT is still present, right? It's hmm. just the research isn't pointed towards that because it, it, when you're doing research, you have to stand on the backs of someone else. You can't just, it's very difficult to do weird, very novel, interesting things, specifically with scheduled substances. Hmm. And so I, you yeah. stand on the back of other people and you look for an NDMT and then, you know, 5-MeO-DMT is present, then you do a subsequent research project. But like somebody has a, to be the first one. And and it's like starting a yeah. religion. Like people make fun of Mormonism because it's new, but really at some point, all religions were a guy going like, and we eat his body and we drink his blood. You know, <laughs> yeah. like- Our death cult, was, this is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. that well, guy was weird. Yeah. Like, that guy- St. Paul was a little bit weird to everybody. You know what I'm saying? And, and the only real difference between a cult and a religion is duration of time of existence, right? Sure. Yeah. You know no, what I mean? True. Arguably. I, 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 I think that's true and it doesn't discredit it. In fact, I'm whenever I watch a cult documentary, I'm pulling for them to not get guns and not have sex with everybody. So am I. It just right? seems that that's like, just the way it, it goes. Together. You're like, dude, <laughs> you, you don't have to turn this into sex. And then all yes. of a sudden, like, you know, 
half the episode later, the guys had sex with 18 people. And you're like, ah, yep. man, you fucked it up. Yep, yep. You had to, I'm not trying to be funny. You had to have sex with a 16 year old. Fuck you, dude. Yeah. Like it looks so nice when you were all wading in the ocean, weeping with ecstasy. <laughs> Literally like so many of them. I'm like, they tell story. What was the one? I can't remember what it was, but it was the weird yoga guy. Like he did a lot of yoga. He was, mm. he was an adult actor. And anyway, uh, yeah, I know what you're you know about. that one. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was giving people a ceremony that was helping them realize if only momentarily, but like kind of God consciousness, like, a, like a, a unitive consciousness experience. And everybody's telling these stories about how transformed they were kind of like my um, five MEO experience, like a life changing Oh my God, we've never not been there. One way to say it is like, we're in heaven right now. There's just kind of like a movie playing. It's like, yeah. it's like one way to think of it. But to talk about that is one thing. I experienced that. But then there are people through breath work or ceremony or whatever, or just kind of what, I don't know how they're doing it. They have that experience. And then they have to 69. You had to 69. Yeah, it seems inevitable. And it's like, Why? And, and I find it, I I find it funny. Well, it it's is. like, he, here's another interesting thing, too, is that, <laughs> you know, human sexuality is, is so profoundly complicated. And one could make the argument that the only reason any of us exist is to procreate. Mm. And now we live in a culture and a society where that's not necessarily relevant. And we're free to explore ourselves and our nuances. But in an absence of that cycle, we don't exist. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have existed a long time. Fuck, nothing would exist. Mm -hmm. So there was like so much built and baked into us from a genetic perspective based on our reproductive cycle. And, you know, so much of that is suppressed. You know, you would have the shame from Catholicism. We have our, our own inability to talk about it and, and you know, and giggle yeah. when you hear the word penis. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're a bunch of kids when it comes down to sexuality. I completely it's, agree. Right. I, yeah. I did, um, this is a, I, I just love talking to a psychedelic person. <laughs> I know you're more than that, but no, I I'll did, take that. That's, I yeah, did a, a ketamine. I'm going to say a ceremony. We did it very intentionally and it was very, very beautiful. And there was a part where me and my friend were like kind of holding each other, hmm. which is funny to say, cause here I have to say like in a very non-sexual way, see, nice. I even have to say that, yeah. but it was incredible earth pete the pete you're talking to right now will not cuddle you adam um it's not gonna happen <laughs> but it's I, I was looking forward to that after the show I'm, well I'm we can't on zoom yeah. we just can't there's no emotion there's ways around it but like once the immediacy of the now becomes so vividly real you're just like oh my god this is it as i like to say the needle is right on the record there's no future there's no past you're just there and you feel your body and you're in your body. And we were talking about it after that some teacher had the the uh, the the illusion or, or the metaphor that we're kind of like a balloon animal. Like, you know, when you make a balloon poodle, yeah. you twist it and then psychedelics untwist it. So you recognize it as one balloon. So it's yeah. always this illusion. And when that becomes clear, cuddling or just... Cuddling sounds like we were rubbing and stuff. We were just holding. We were like leaning on each other. Just presence with one another. You know what yes. I mean? Like, and that's and that's more of an accurate way of saying it is that we, you know, I, I look at it this way. It's like, you know, you, you're born and you're this this energetic being and, and you're given a name. You're slowly given identity and your behaviors are either encouraged or rebuked by your parents and then your peer groups. And eventually you just keep developing this concept of self. But it's riddled with negative and positive things. And you have all these coping mechanisms that perhaps would have been relevant in that moment. But 15 years later, that's why you drink. That's why you you're are a serial right. dater. You're you right know? in the middle lane of this podcast, man. You are fitting in perfectly. We're always <laughs> talking about outdated modalities that helped you survive psychologically mostly, but sometimes yeah. physically as a child that now are why you drink or why you can't commit to somebody or why you blow things yeah. up right before they get serious. It's because the love that you were taught was somehow was unsafe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was somehow unsafe. And and then you were like, well, that's not, that's too sticky. That's like tar. Love is like a trap. So I will self-sabotage or I don't deserve this, this or this, or I'll medicate or whatever it might be. But it, you can have such compassion for yourself and be like, I'm just doing something that worked this is Alan Day Button. He was like, it worked brilliantly when you were nine. 
yeah. and you need to stop because you're 39. <laughs> you yeah, but, but everything is so wound. Like I, I find, you know, when I started doing psychedelics, the one thing that I thought was so amazing is how profoundly complicated we all are. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like some people are just like, oh, all I need is you know, sex and food and shelter. And I'm good. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But when you really start breaking down the incredible nuances of our psyche, like we are a profoundly complicated record of every single experience that we've ever had and the emotional ramifications of said experiences. Wow. And that that's a, a fucking incredible thing to unpack. It you know is. what I mean? Yes. It is. And you, you get in there and you start being like, oh my God, this, this interesting nuanced uh, behavioral trait is connected to bye. all these different things. It's like this. Welcome to the show. You're so good. You're so good. We're uh, keep going. I'm just, I'm just complimenting uh, you. You're I just, so good. I, I just, I find it so weirdly nuanced, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and it, it's, it's scary being vulnerable with yourself, you know, cause you can be vulnerable with another human being if you choose to. And if you're rejected, you can fucking walk away from that and you can bury that somewhere inside yourself and start anew. But if, if you're vulnerable with yourself, you have nowhere to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you of open course. that Pandora's box, you just peek in, in the corner and it's open. And that's and, been my experience with psychedelics. And my experience with psychedelics too, is it's like, it's, it's this uh, voice of like, it's okay. Like, let's look. Yeah. It's okay. Meaning it's going to like flood you with white light love. I know people have different experiences. I'm just talking about some that I've had. And that emboldens you to go, let's take a peek at this. Because like not looking is a coping strategy. Like oh, denial. It totally is. It, yeah. Like it's fingers in the ear. It's yeah. You Everything's know? fine. Stick your head in the sand and then just keep on treading water. And it's like, fine. Yep. It, it but, works. Like, yeah, like I, I'll even, yeah. I'll even compliment it and say like, good for you. That works. Cause after this ketamine experience, man, I, I was really like very open. I was like, wow, this is so wild. Most people don't really know what I mean when I say this, meaning I've said it to people and they just don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm like, it's so crazy that we're alive that 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 is. being is they they yeah. mean oh we didn't get hit by a car when we were a kid or or, or this i just i'm like no 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 i don't mean circumstantially i mean like it's crazy that life existentially is. yeah yes. like a series of seemingly inanimate things moving together and coalescing into a self-replicating structure that emerged ah. now billions of years later as me and you having a fucking conversation yeah that's weird yeah that's it's that's so amazing. weird yeah. And then, so when I was in that very clean, very safe, but also very naked field, when I was merging with a very naked, this was just three, four nights ago, I was like, oh, I'm this. And then I came back, you know, and even when I was on it, I could elect to come back. It wasn't like overwhelmingly, you know, I wasn't stuck in it. I could, yeah. I could come back and move my body or, or laugh or whatever it was. And then... When I came back, I was like, you know, I'm driving my daughter to school and one of the songs she likes goes like, num, 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 num. It's like, it's called num, num. And I was like, this song and like all these things we're doing, and again, I'm not even putting it down, is like a way of kind of going like, this isn't that weird. Listen, num, 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 num. Like think about num, num, num. You know, like it's it's actually good. It's like, don't get overwhelmed with this. Just num, 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 num. And I was like, so much of life is distracting ourselves from the fact that it's so bizarre to be that would rather just kind of like get lost in a song or a show or whatever, or food or sex or whatever. All the while, the mystery was there the whole time. And what I like about psychedelics is it invites us to go like, you don't have to num 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 all the time. It's safe. We're back to that theme. It's like you can you can trust it. Don't be afraid of yourself. Don't be afraid of yourself. Well, and yeah, like it's funny when you were talking about before when you when you do five meo that you say you know sort of I trust you. I'm going to come back. And it's funny that I do the exact same thing. I always mm. say to myself, I love you and I trust you. Talking to myself. Talking to myself. And I just and I just let go because I. You know, I, I look at it this way. When people want to control or they're struggling to control, like, you know, when you go into a psychedelic experience, the difficult thing about that is submission, submitting to perhaps a higher self, submitting to the experience, just relinquishing control. And mm. so many people are really difficult at that. And more often than not, I'm like, well, 
how have you been doing in your life thus far? You know, how is how has you been steering the ship working for you? You're on several SSRIs. You're fucking anxious. You have, you know, this sea of destroyed relationships. That this is... undercurrent of perpetual anxiety. Would, you know, that's what I'm saying. Wouldn't you like a different captain? Let a different captain yeah. just for 20 minutes, just for 20 minutes. Let them steer. And it's you. Yes. Keep, yeah, I'm so with you. <laughs> yeah. And it's like and, and the person steering the ship is is a byproduct of a lifetime of perceived shittiness and coping mechanisms. And yes, wonderful things, too. Life can be profoundly beautiful. Mm. However, it can also be really shitty and it has to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's it's I always look at it this way is that you you need to be programmed by culture, by society, by life to be a functioning adult. Mm -hmm. You have to get kicked off a horse, punched in the face, you know, have negative things happen to you to develop appropriate coping mechanisms to be adult in society and be productive. But at the same time, being programmed subsequently gives you the capacity to unprogram yourself, mm -hmm. to unwind and sort through all the nonsense and all these weird nuances of experience. And yes. You know, I, I have found it profoundly beautiful, terrifying, scary, sad, magnificent in this space where I am both the therapist and the patient in this perfect unity of magnificence, just being like, yeah, man, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's okay that that happened. You know, the shame associated with this memory, the fear associated with this memory, the all these other little nuances of behavioral tendencies associated with this memory don't need to exist. And that, it really is just an act of self-forgiveness. Yeah. Where you're like, yeah, I've been a douchebag in my life. We yes. all fucking have. And it's I've okay. been selfish. I've been self-seeking. That's a big one for me as I'm like, yeah. every choice you make, and this seems so obvious, you're just going like, well, how's that pay out for me? Even things like if I take Leela, my daughter, to Taekwondo, I'll get pride. I'll get to watch her doing something and being, you know, good at it and trying and growing. But I'm still kind of at least partially thinking, I'll say my daughter is the closest I've come to true generosity. Right? Yeah. But most people I'm like, yeah, I'll go to your party because I'll have fun. There'll be food. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to be a guy who's at a thing. Like, and, and what you just said, though, my therapist always used to just say, who cares? That was like his big mantra was to go, who cares? Like I'd tell him something that I was ashamed of and he'd go, who cares? And that was the voice that he gave me. And psychedelics give you a much more, it's fine. Like it's it's not, it's 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 so much more liberating than that. It, it, like it floods you with this love and acceptance that's that's hard to get at through just the brain, through just telling yourself it's okay. Well, and it, it kind of is, right? <laughs> like, you know, I, I've, I've said this so many times is that the vast majority of us would never tolerate being in a relationship with someone who talks to us the way that we talk to ourselves. Yeah. And, and again, that doesn't apply to everyone, but it really does apply to most people. You know, yeah. the shit that you say into the mirror, like fucking idiot, you screwed this up. No one's going to like you. Everyone's going to, you know what I mean? Like it's just this mm -hmm. constant repetitiveness. And, and, and a lot of the times too with people, I'm just like, well, what would you say to a friend who was in this situation? What would you say to someone you really cared about? And more often than not, like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. But yeah, we could never tell ourselves that. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone can give the best advice on the planet, but no one can really take it themselves. Because we're, talking, yeah. Yep. I was talking to a friend who's going through a thing last night and I was like, it's a season. You're in winter right now. And as inevitable as winters are, springs are just as inevitable. So you can't have... You can't like just focus on the inevitability of downtimes. You also have to say, well, if that's true, I know there are springs. I've had a lot of springs and look at the clue of nature. It just seems to go in these cycles. But like when I'm down, I'm like, this is forever. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, like, <laughs> there's ah, no that, way that's out. It. Oh that's my it. God. Yeah. Yes. You know, something came to mind a minute ago when you were saying, I love you and I trust you. That's what you hmm. say. Yeah before a, a journey that that's very similar to me as, as we already said, but I'm, I'm thinking about my friend, um, Shane Moss, who's a great psychedelic entrepreneur. I don't even know what to say, but he's, he's a big voice in that world, but he's also very not spiritual. And he would say he'd, he'd go on like a DMT trip, he'd meet God or something. And he would say, you're not, he would say to it, I am always like the balls. He'd say to this impossible geometric 
undulating (laughs) light or whatever fractal perfection or something yes and he'd just go you're just my mind and where i'm sitting and i've said this to shane i'm like but what is your mind that's why i'm like it's why does why does that exist in there you know what i mean like what's where in this physical brain because i'm going to make the assumption that he's a materialist and a rationalist which is not an insult yeah he's just based on the scientific perception of the world around us and western philosophy it's like okay but where does that perfect self-perpetuating fractal of all existence exist inside your brain and what, why, why is, is, is that, that in the, the hypothalamus is yeah. that reside in your visual cortexes like yeah. you know that's and why why does that end the conversation i i once was this sounds like i do drugs all the time i don't i don't know why that little flare up of of purity i don't want to see seem a certain <laughs> way but i was on lsd one time and i was like picturing something something beautiful maybe it might've even been religious or like iconic, like, like a Jesus or something like that. And I go, but this is just my imagination. And the experience said like, what is your imagination? Like, why does that end the conversation? It was just my mind. What the fuck is your mind? That's what we're talking about. What well, is and consciousness? Yeah. And and you started hinting at this and I'm going to hit this to you. So Rupert Spiro really broke this down for me. It's like the material view is that consciousness is a phenomenon in a material body designed that that material body can experience reality, which is weird. So it's like a, it's a tool for a separate thing to experience reality, which is, which is real. And then the spiritual or the, whatever you want to say, non-materialist perspective is that consciousness is first. That consciousness, just like a dream, you go to bed and you create a world and you touch it and you see it and you feel it. And it seems to be coming from you. It's localized in you and it's out there that this is not that different. There's nothing to touching other than knowing there's nothing to seeing other than knowing. So it's like, it's like a, it's a reversal of it. And you kind of hinted at that. So when you go into it, you're going into the the source of everything, which is consciousness, yeah. which is another word for that is, is your mind. So you go into your mind and you say to God, you're just my mind. I, if I was that God, I'd be like, just, exactly. In a way, he's not wrong. It's like, he's not well, wrong. Yeah. You he's know what I mean? Wrong. I'm like, fair enough. Yeah. But, it's... but going like, but you're just my mind in a brain, in a, in a, in a skull, in a body. But, but here's the problem with that too, is like, you know, a really good friend of mine's a, a professor of quantum physics and a good friend of mine is a neuroscientist. And I've been to neuroscience conventions and the one thing they all agree on is like, we don't know what consciousness is. Yeah. We don't know where it emerges from. You know, it's, you look at at our brain and I'm like, okay, if I have a series of neurons and we're sort of like an on and off switch, like a, like sort of a binary code, zero, one, zero, one, you know, how does all of the conscious experiences that I have elicit from this physical brain? And there's not really an answer to that. Like they come up relatively short. And there's some like neuroscientists who are, are reaching a little bit further in the ideas of that you know, there's quantum tubules and our brains are more of a quantum computer. So it's not just yes or no, it's you have the variability of superpositioning within a quantum field that gives rise to the complex nature of our of our consciousness. Mm. And I know for me, like, you know, being dead briefly, you know, for 11 and a half minutes, electrocution was, it was very much like a psychedelic experience. It was, and People commonly are like, well, did you see entities if you claim it was a DMT experience? And like, no, like it's, I personally think, and I do think this is backed up by science. I don't believe this is anecdotal, is that when we die or we go into cardiac arrest or have these profoundly terrifying experiences that mimic that to yourself, you're having this perfect biological release of 5-MeO-DMT, dimethyl, like, you know, NN-DMT, and a whole variety of other various things that are present in your body. It's this massive endogenous release that occurs. Mm. And there's different contexts for that. You know, some people think that it's as a neuroprotectant because I'm going to cardiac arrest and these compounds, DMT and 5-MeO-DMT, will protect me from hypoxia because, you know, they give them to people post-strokes with incredible effects. What's my hypoxia? hypoxia would be hypoxia of oxygen yeah or apoxia i get kind of the same thing okay and so to me it's like well why does why does this happen okay if it is to keep me present and reduce the amount of biological destruction in my brain fair enough but why does it also cause these profoundly spiritual experiences 
You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and if evolution is predominantly designed to get me from point A to reproduction and that's it, it's unique that this also gives sort of this <sighs> points of mercy when you're being ripped apart by a bunch of hyenas. Mm. You know what I mean? Like why, why is there a <laughs> biological process that really is not relevant for procreation that makes me go off into this beautiful state of awareness and being while I'm having my stomach ripped apart? You know, and, and I find that sort of a unique thing in, in this context where it's like, well, what is death and what is the purpose of death? And what is the purpose of all these near-death experiences that surround it? To me, like death is basically just simply a finite conclusion to something that is purely cyclical. Mm. And the near-death experience, whether or not it has a double effect as a mechanism to reduce neurological damage during a cardiac arrest... But let's be realistic. If you go back in evolutionary times, if I go into cardiac arrest, when did we start doing CPR? When did we have defibrillators? At what point in time did we have an evolved medical society in which we could successfully resuscitate people in an appropriate period of time? Mm. So that only is really relevant to modern technology. So mm. why do we have this profound release of these compounds in our body that elicit a profoundly spiritual experience when we die? And so that would be my argument to, to rationalists and materialists. And and people who say it's just a byproduct of some chemicals in your brain, you know, like like your friend who has had the experiences and then still boils it down to it's just simply neurons ticking away. That's fair. Because at the end of the day, I don't necessarily care how people interpret it. Mm -hmm. You know, the experiences that we have are so personally our own and how we interpret them is is entirely unique to us as individuals. I know that what I drew from my experience is that we're all facets of an infinite complexity experienced in self subjectively. Mm. And the only real purpose of existence simply is to experience. There's no yeah. real right or wrong. There's no morality that exists within this, you know, and we're all part of it. A blade of grass is conscious, mm. you know, a dolphin, a dog, everything is present in this perfect system of just life. Yeah. And, and overcomplicating it is it adds nuances and, and depth to it that doesn't necessarily need to be present. It's just simply a perfect system of contrast. This episode is brought to us by our friends at Vita Coco. I love Vita Coco when I'm feeling sluggish or dehydrated, or I just want to give myself a natural sweet treat without loading myself with added sugars and chemicals found in way too many beverages. I reach and have always reached for a Vita Coco. It's real. It's natural. It's from the earth, but it still tastes like a treat. Vita Coco is the number one coconut water brand in the United States. Get some balance in your life with healthy beverages that are actually fun. And Vita Coco comes in wonderful flavors, not just coconut, but pineapple and peach and mango, which I can tell you are incredible. Coconut water has nutrients to supercharge you and make you feel good. Helps amazing with recovery, post-workout, post dance party and after my workout vita coco replenishes me that keeps me performing at my best shining strong for the rest of the day it's also a wonderful mixer you can throw it in with some tequila agave and a squeeze of lime and you have an amazing cocktail that has electrolytes and nutrients in there which means a better feeling morning after it's also wonderful for, for mocktails and because of the electrolytes coconut water can help bring you back to life after a night of partying as well. So take 25% off and get Vita Coco shipped to your door, which is how I get it shipped to me by using code WEIRD20 at VitaCoco.com. Or if you prefer to shop in store, find Vita Coco at most big name grocery stores in your city, as well as superstores like Walmart, drug stores like CVS, and your local convenience stores and bodegas. That's VitaCoco.com. Get 20% off with code WEIRD20 at checkout. We're also brought to us by our friends at Ritual. As you guys know, my pre, post, and probiotic and my multivitamin for men for years has been from our friends at Ritual. If supporting foundational health was a sport, trust me, guys, you would want Ritual on your team. They made Essential for Men, a multivitamin that is based solely on science and designed to help fill common nutrient gaps in your diet with 10 key nutrients. According to the CDC, fewer men than women Meet the minimum daily intake requirement for fruits and vegetables, and men are more likely to overvalue exercise and undervalue nutrition. So enter Ritual. They are here with a multivitamin scientifically developed for men to help fill those gaps in their diets. I've been taking it for years. 
two pills in the morning, actually three, because I take the multi and I take the Symbiotic Plus probiotic every morning. It's got a minty essence, and you don't just pee it out like predator blood because it has a delayed release effect, so it breaks down in your low intestine where these vitamins can actually be absorbed. 10 key nutrients in those delayed release capsules per day designed to dissolve later in the small intestine, which is great for fasting, gentle on an empty stomach, and a minty essence in every bottle that makes taking your multis actually enjoyable. So Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash weird. Start Ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash weird for 25% off. Yeah, my friend just did NNDMT and he came back and he was asking it about all these evils and problems. And it was like, the message he got was like, this will be fine. <laughs> like the whole, the big this, like there's, there's all this strife and there's suffering, but he was like, it's fine. <laughs> like what the thing is, it is, is yeah, fine. Like everything People don't is really okay. like that. We kind of want justice. We want to, we want a God to swoop in and be like, this will not stand and it, this is this is where it gets a little bit hard to talk about, but it's like my friend who guided me through my five MEO on his own experience was like, he was like, God is an insane, he used the word insane, mm -hmm. undulating fractal of, of, of chaos, doing anything and everything that it could possibly do for its own exploration or joy or whatever. But I always remember that he used the word insane. I, I don't, typically love saying that, but I know what he means, meaning it's like, it's doing, my friend Michael Gunger wrote this book and he goes, if you were infinity, what game wouldn't you play? That yeah. That's that's what he said. And that's kind of what it's doing. It's going like a, a more romantic or a gentler way to put it is um, that infinity is in love with the pro production of time. Like it's in love with exploring and playing. And even on my most recent ketamine thing, it was like, it's all for, and it would say your own joy, it, but it meant God, but it was like you, it's well, all for its own yeah. play. Like here's, here's an interesting thought exercise. It's like, if, if you were sort of this infant self-perpetuating fractal of absolute everything. Okay. Well, that's cool. That's fucking boring. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. you, you, you need contrast. And I find what life gives is that the knowledge, whether you, you know, perceive it or not, is that at, at some point, everything that you love, everything that you've ever had will be gone. Yeah. Your identity will be gone. Your, your egoic structure, your, your family, everything that you care about will be gone. But the, the fact that that will be gone gives relevance to the fact that you have it right now. It's, it's the clock at the basketball game. Yeah. There is no basketball like game if it just goes forever. Forever, it, yeah. The score is 98 billion to 76 billion. It's like, what a snooze. You put a clock on the game. I also want to put this to you. My my great teacher, Rupert Spire, also says, if you were to have a dream of a Caribbean beach, like you picture a Caribbean beach, he's like, you can't experience it as, as a dream until you localize yourself as a point, like a body, mm. or it could be a bird or a rock, but you have to put yourself in the dream. So if I'm hearing you correctly, infinite, boundless, spaceless, sort of identityless, pure being was, was or, or you could say has always been. And then it elected like a mother who has a child, even though it would cause pain and suffering and loss, it elected to enter into a dance where there is heartbreak and violence and horror. Yeah. Because as soon as you have, well, I want to know what pleasure feels like. Well, you're also going to know what betrayal feels like. And you're going to know what being broke feels like. But you're also going to know what yeah. abundance feels like. Because it was like, and this is where you get the idea of God loving us. It's like God's loving us as us. God's loving us by becoming us. God isn't somewhere, and I want your take on this, watching us going, I love Adam. God right, is yeah. loving God is Adam. me in this specific moment transmitted through my biology. Yes. And you know, I am exists. God being the best Adam I can be in this yes. biological meat suit in this moment. And so is every other living thing. Yes. And that love is, is like, 
I'll risk. It's sort of like having our kids. It's like I'd risk anything for my kid. And and this this love would risk, like Adam, both you and I are in the wild. You know what I mean? Anything yeah. could happen. What a nightmare. What a terror. But it's also, it's the clock on the game and it leads to this connection that we're experiencing right now. You know what I mean? Like this urgency, this this game, like, oh my God, Adam, oh, is this, and I want to talk about that. And that feeling was worth the risk of, and also Adam, you could tell me I'm a piece of shit. You could be like, <laughs> I, I don't like you. I don't like the way you're mine. Ah! But it's like, it wants to, we are the eyes of the universe experiencing yeah. itself. Yeah, that's a very apt way to phrase that is that we are the sensory organs of the universe. Yes. And I feel that people get stuck with this idea that humans are the sensory, you know, of the universe. And it's like, no, like every living thing is part of this system. It doesn't yeah. have to be anthropomorphic in the sense that everything is human centric. Yeah. You know, like a tree. I, I, I yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like in, in a tree, like Jesus Christ, they, they show preferential treatment and carbon distribution to their offspring via like mycelial networks. Or when they mourn the mother tree. Have you heard about that? Yeah. You like cut it's... down the tree that they all came from. They'll keep the stump alive for like decades by feeding it nutrients because it was their mother. Fucking nuts. Fucking yeah, and nuts. You, and you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of interesting things that occur on this planet that show layers of consciousness in a way that we have difficulty understanding because it's not reflective of our own. You know, I think that's why when we think about aliens coming, that they, they show up and they kick the fucking door down and we're taking your resources. And you're like, yeah, we think that because that's what we do. Bye. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's the only thing that we have to compare around us is, is our so, own behavior. It's so human centric. And we do the same thing to God, meaning I see a God, I see a field of awareness that is allowing everything. I, I say this on stage sometimes. I go, my God is so love you wouldn't like him. It, it's so yeah. allowing, it's so yes, that you don't like it because we impose our characteristics on God. And this is where you get ideas like hell. Well, well I want to yeah. destroy my enemies. Surely God also have a better God. Like what? You just yeah, made this Old the Testament eye for an eye. And you're like, Jesus Christ, man. It's right. You know, like, I, you just I turned it, like, it into your yeah. alcoholic dad, basically, or yeah, like a dictator. You're, you're, you're projecting all of your own deep-seated insecurities and fears and discontent and anger onto this, you know, bearded sky daddy who's casting judgment around you. Hopefully, judgment against the people that you don't like. Right. And and I find that vaguely ironic that, you know, and, and again, I, I do think that most religions have some sort of epicenter of psychedelic use when you go back far enough. Yeah. Have you read The Immortality you know I mean? Key? Brian Murray. Yes, what a great Murarescu. book. Yeah. yeah. Brian's a friend of mine. I'm so privileged to say that. And I'll just text him. Like, I texted him about John 3.16. I was like, what is, what is the trans, what is the Greek when it's like, uh, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but, oh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. I was like, what does that word believe mean? And dude, I, I hope you think this is interesting. I'm like, we, we've hinged a whole religion on like, you have to believe in God. He sent me this huge text where he was like, it's not, it's not like an idea. It's more like accepting your own deification. <laughs> and he like broke it down. But he was like, it's, you don't have to believe in Jesus, you know the man. I mean? like, you have to believe in the Christ that's in you right now and, and identify with it. That's belief. That, that's, that's conversion. Yeah. Like you, you can take the original sort of text of any religion and you can find sort of this psychedelic notion of self-love and perpetuation and, and this idea of infinite existence. It's just that I think that you have to tell stories in a way that the masses can understand and not everyone can go and have these profound shamanic experiences. Mm. And so you break it down into these digestible stories because, you know, even when I died, I remember I was telling a friend of mine, and during my death experience, I it was there was like an ego death. I, I wasn't anything. I was just this, you know, perfect level of awareness, seeing spherically out and it's from a single point in the void. Mm. He's like, Well, how are you not you? And I'm like, I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. He's like, I, I can't. And it, it just you could see these gears starting to like, you know, chip and pieces of metal coming out. And <laughs> and and I get that concept. You have to turn things into something that's digestible for the masses. 
Yeah, because as soon as you time, took the character yeah. Adam out of the story, the guy was like, "I've lost the thread. I don't know." Yeah, he's like, "This is about. stupid." And he was yeah. like, he was almost getting like angry, and I'm like, yes. "Dude, you don't, you don't got to fucking hear the story, man. Yeah. Like, I can retell it in a way that you would like." But right now, you basically just have these ideas of focusing your ideas of love and divinity towards an anthropomorphic being that we can all agree is something special that is looking out for me, guarding me, providing me with love, providing me with all these things. When I think that the moral of the story from the very beginning was that all of that is within inside us. Yes. You know what and I mean? Like we, no, so go. I, I, go. Finish your thought. Oh, just the idea that divinity resides in all of us and yeah. the struggle of life is somehow finding a way to become aware of that and embrace it. It's funny, again, Rupert Spira is always trying to go like, this is not as far out as it sounds. He goes, deep sleep is the experience of awareness without an object. And and he his one of his ways of comforting people on death is he goes, we don't dread sleep. We love it. We look forward to it. Like, you can't wait. But he goes, you can't deny that there is an experience of sleep. We think it, it's oh, yeah. over, but it's not. You don't lie down, cut to morning. There was an experience. And he goes, it's not the absence of awareness. It's the awareness of absence. So you get this blissed out, rejuvenating homecoming every night in deep sleep. It, it, some people have problems. Yeah, I was going to say, Mike, not all the time. But yeah, I, I get I get what you're saying. Most of us do for some time, which is one of the reasons why it's, it's so weird to fuck with your sleep and you know go to bed drunk and all that stuff. Know. You got to get that time. But it, it is a spiritual thing. You vanish and it's timeless and it's empty and it's you can trust it and it was safe. So Adam wasn't there, meaning there wasn't, in deep sleep, there's nothing going, I am Pete and I'm asleep and this is boring. Pete would be bored, but this naked awareness has no needs. So it's not going like, when are we going to wake up? It's just, go, it's just, enjoying itself it's like the the flashlight of awareness turns back on itself and is totally cool that's we should tell your your story because you had we can maybe just do it bullet points because i am aware that you've told it a million times but you electrocuted yourself when you were 30 31 yeah so i was i was 2018 so i would have been like 38 or something and 37 and I was, I do a lot of woodworking and stuff like that. And here, sorry, my phone's beeping. I'm going to turn it off, but I guess that's irrelevant. And so <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of woodworking. And one of the things that a friend of mine wanted me to make for him was using this device where you, you take like a transformer from a microwave, you strip every possible safety feature from it, you plug it into a wall and that 110 volts AC turn into like 12,000 volts DC. And then you put it on wood with a little bit of like uh, water and baking soda and it etches these patterns in it. And it's really cool. And at the time they were all over the place and then everyone started dying. It became like an endemic to some extent and there was like bands, they became illegal. And Whoa. so I'm, I'm hanging out with my friend, and he had taken like a high voltage safety course, you know, like literally a couple days before, which was profoundly convenient. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm burning this stuff and I'm having a conversation with him. It's at my house. And I was getting ready to move it because you just move one at a time, which again is the stupidest fucking thing if you think about it, but I'm, mm -hmm. here we all are. Mm -hmm. And so I moved it and then all of a sudden it just, the other one, it was too close and it just arced into my hand. And so it was like someone flicked a switch. It was just ungodly amounts of pain. Like every single cell in my body was being ripped into pieces. Mm -hmm. And visually it was just these, cylinders that went up and down forever like a barcode it was weird iridescent green to some extent and wow, i remember a, trying to what force... a great i can't believe you oh, remember dude. that that's incredible i remember the entire experience vividly wow and so i'm just these bars is all that <laughs> you saw the upc point. code <laughs> yeah of Adam. totally yeah like the old school <laughs> tv you know like the barcodes running across yeah and i remember forcing a thought like i'm being electrocuted i don't think i'm breathing and then all of a sudden, I just felt like I was falling for this prolonged period of time. And then I just woke up. Falling forward or falling been. backwards? Is, is that a there, dumb question? there was no real... No, it's not really. It makes sense. I, yeah. I don't think that there was... It was still like incredibly painful. Mm. And it just felt like someone... Like the floor had just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Like I just felt like this movement downwards, I guess. Just like, just like movies. You yeah. know, 
Again, on yeah. my on my ketamine experience recently, I was like, movies do a good job. Like some people have done a brilliant job yeah. recreating what is so hard to explain in film. I'm like, this is amazing. Like the worst person yeah. in the world did a really good mushroom sequence. <laughs> yeah. and, but like death being like falling through the ground or like that makes me think of um, Get Out when you kind of like go into the upside yeah. down. and yeah. But you're falling down. And the reason I asked forward or backward is, is Terrence McKenna says, when you smoke five MEO, and I was sort of waiting for this and I, I sort of had it. He's like, there's like a rolling forward. Like you feel like you roll, you like roll out of yourself. People that um, leave their bodies, that, that elect to leave their bodies also roll mm -hmm. out. And I, that's interesting that there's a, there's a temporal uh, Somewhere, a direction that we perceive during this process. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and so I guess I just, just woke up in this place and I wasn't Adam. I wasn't anything. I wasn't alive or dead. It was just like this raw state of consciousness. And it was like perfect contentment. Hmm. And I find some people get weird about that. Like it wasn't bliss or love. I'm like, no, it was perfect contentment. It was just, it was awesome there. Hmm. And it became me very aware of how biologically programmed we are to be happy, hungry, horny, sad, jealous, angry, all of these things that come with this body, but it was just devoid of that. And I remember very specifically seen from a single point outwards spherically, whatever that might mean. Mm. And it seemed like outer space, there was like just sort of stars in the distance. And I was just hanging out. It was like mm. perfect contentment. Do you and then I trip felt this, out on, right? I'm sorry, Adam, but I, I feel like you won't forget the next part. Do you ever trip out on the fact that like reality itself is sort of a clue to our, our true nature? Meaning like we are in outer space and when we go into inner space, it sort of reflects that sort of like a single point earth surrounded by space infinite. And, and does that, does that ever feel like a little wink? <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't sometimes like, you know, I've analyzed this to some degree. I choose not to really look too deeply into it and just accept the experience for what it is. But I remember mm. thinking, I'm like, do I just create, like, does your subconscious draw upon memories to provide a background or a screen for an experience that doesn't really need it? but it's there anyways you know what i mean much much like in dreams you're, you're as, as you reference you're you're pulling out memories and different things perhaps yeah. in the days previous and collecting this weird juxtaposition of shit that you're moving through and seemingly totally okay with the fact that your floors are gold and your banisters a snake and all this weird <laughs> shit and it's just providing context perhaps yeah but it's funny i was going a much more hopeful direction where i'm like you love yourself so much that you put yourself in this dream, but in the dream, there are things like looking at the stars. My daughter, the other night, I'm rocking her, we're looking at the stars. And she goes, when I look at the stars, she just got old enough to say things like this. She goes, I see something so familiar and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, like you've been there before? You've been in outer space? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I see, if it is all just us, meaning it's all just this one self, I see grace in going, here's the ocean. Look at poetry. Look at Mary Oliver. Look at how many things, look at the trees keeping the tree alive. I don't see that as, oh, so your experience was nonsense. Like, let me just recreate it through images that I know. I go, you were in, this is me, you were in ultimate reality. And there's things in this reality that reflect and remind us of ultimate reality. I, I look at it that way. Well, I completely agree with you. Like, I personally think the entire universe and consciousness is just math. I, I think it's a self-perpetuating fractal. And I, you see fractals in math everywhere around you. Mm. And the ocean and the leaves and the structures of everything is a mm -hmm. fractal. Mm -hmm. Everything is mathematically influenced. Mm. And so I totally understand what you're saying. I agree with that completely. Yeah. Okay. But, so oh, yeah. go ahead. So, yeah. So in, in that space, it was just existing. And then I felt sort of this frequency washing over me. And it was like, boo, 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 boo. there's this gasoline on water of like rainbow fractals. And it was like this, again, a juxtaposition of like emotions and feelings and love. And it was, it was really beautiful. And, mm. and I just, it was comforting in a way, not that I needed comfort, but it was there. And then I just felt myself being just pulled into pieces and becoming the fabric of the universe. And it was. That is perfect. so psychedelic going like there it was comforting. Is. I know, <laughs> yeah. but you go, there was comfort which I didn't really need. Like I was already okay, but you're yeah. like, huh, comforting. Okay. Could you step out the idea that you were content 
over bliss? Like what, what is the distinction there? Well, I, I feel like contentment. Well, here's the thing too. Like if you had bliss, bliss is an extreme of something. You know what I mean? Like it requires contrast to be relevant. If That's you were right. in bliss all the time, bliss would cease to be bliss. And then you would need to get kicked in the face or be, you know, something to give contrast, to give meaning to bliss. Contentment is just perfect. You Contentment are, is, what a gift you are. That is so good. Well, it really is. Like it's, it's so and, good. And people get fucked up over that. They're like, why wasn't it bliss? It should be bliss. And I'm like, yeah, but bliss isn't an extreme. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, if you existed in bliss all the time, would it even have meaning? And then what, you know what I mean? Like, it really reminds me, there's this, I say it all the time, but there's this Alan Watts thing where he goes, a thought experiment. Just imagine that you're, um, you have a dial and, and you can turn it. And the more you turn it, just the better you feel. And you turn it, eventually you just turn it all the way up. But it, it's it's a crescendo. It just keeps building. Every five minutes, you feel five times better. And he goes, how long would you do that? Like, just really think about yeah. it. How long do you want to be having an orgasm? And he goes, yeah. before you make a big red button that says on it, something happens. Like, like Sim City. I used to play Sim City and I turned the disasters off and it fucking sucked. And it sucks, dude. It I know sucked. what you mean, man. It yeah. sucked. So you <laughs> yeah. go up and after a while you're like, I'm going to put in a tornado because I wanted... It doesn't feel good to have a flourishing digital city on your Apple II GS <laughs> unless you just recovered from that tornado. And to anybody that's suffering right now, I'm not I'm not saying that's a that's a good thing to think about after you've pulled yourself out of it. I'm not trying to impose that perspective on anybody that's going through it today. But there's something about like we don't just want bliss because good feelings exist to the other side of the coin of a bad feeling. Yeah, you require both of them for either one to be relevant. And that's the whole thing, by the way. As soon as it's the Garden of Eden, as soon as we entered into duality, and isn't it funny that they eat the apple of good and evil? So it's yes and no, one and zero. So they leave the garden by eating the apple of duality because we wanted to experience it. We wanted to play. But as soon as we do that, that's when we start having jealousy as well as compassion or generosity. Or we start having yeah. all the... and then when we start getting a weird God that we construct, it's because we're leaning into the, the the dark side of the coin. Like we're favoring that more than the other. And then we get all these weird greed and, and violence and all this hatred and all that stuff. But we're, we're just losing that balance. We're losing the dance. Well, and you know, you, you look at Eastern philosophies as, as you were referring to earlier in this, like, you know, you look at, you know, Taoism for instance, Taoism is fundamentally based on balance and not struggling against the nature of perceived existence. It's, mm. you know, you, you look at Buddhism, you look at Jainism and, and Sikhism and all these different things. And it's a lot of it is about achieving balance and the idea that suffering only exists because we allow it to in ourselves. And that's a really easy fucking thing to say. It's like, oh, suffering simply exists because we allow it. But like, you have to really understand the fact that suffering is perspective based on some level mm. you know what mm -hmm. i mean and again like you just said i don't want to minimize someone who's stuck in depression or something these are good conversations after that like don't yeah anybody listening if you if you're resonating with this as i am don't have coffee with that friend who's in a hard time and be like this is a this is a perspective yeah, don't, it's all in your head choice. bro and you're like or, yeah but that's that's where they are right now it's afterwards yeah. when you come out of it and you realize that you don't have to identify by perceived victimization. You don't have to identify by pain. And all of that shittiness just gives value to everything good in your life. That's right. That You that, know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be more or less bliss. than that. Yes. Yeah. You know, I've I've been to Disneyland where they let you to the front of the line. Guys, I'm sorry. It's not. This is one of the interesting things about becoming like a, a public person and like a success yeah. in this weird field. I know that going to Disneyland and going to the front of the line fucking i'm being real it fucking sucks you know what's great about disneyland you go to pirates and there just happens to be no line that's the that oh yeah that that's good it's yeah. not good to be like well i got the fast pass elite jerk jerk pass like fuck <laughs> off well it's it it's also to some extent too like i you know i had covid over christmas and it sucked 
obviously. But I remember like coming out of it. I'm like, oh man, like, you know, being normal is going to feel so fucking good that's after it. feeling shitty. That's it. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's like a very simple way as sort of like a metaphor to be like, yeah, you have to feel bad or because if you don't, you take for granted for what you are normally and then it ceases to have value. It's death and resurrection. This is the, it's not just the pattern of Christianity. One of the reasons why Christianity resonates as much as it does is because it's telling us this is the pattern. It's dying and being reborn thousands and thousands of times, sometimes in a day. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes right. like it's... in a day. Dude, yeah, I, I had yeah, a rough man. morning with my daughter. My daughter's having such a hard time being dropped off at school. And I know that sounds like very low. It's uh it does dude and i will flat out agree with you in this like i'm not at that point yet but when she's like screaming because of some form of discomfort i feel horrible i did it gets inside my chest and i'm like oh my god i'm like okay. let's just work through this because i can't I oh my god i came home with val today i was worried about this podcast i go every day a fresh trauma Every morning, a fresh <laughs> trauma. Yeah, man. And then I'm like, yeah. how am I supposed to fucking do anything? I did a bunch of stuff to kind of turn my mood around. One of which being reassuring myself that Leela loves school. She just doesn't like being dropped off. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Sorry. You, I cut you off at a very interesting point. After the gasoline iridescent, you put that so beautifully. Yeah. You then dissolved into everything. Any? Well, I started to. It was like I was just being pulled apart. And it was mm. perfect. It was like everything that this was the perfect conclusion to this was mm. just joining back to source or it or the universe itself. Did Was there an eye to think I'm being pulled apart or was no. it? Yeah. It was just being. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And being, again, I'm, I'm referencing my own 5MEO. It's like even the idea of being pulled apart is sort of funny. Like, it it can't go anywhere, but it's the. It, does this make sense? Like we're adding language yeah. to something. The essence of it, reality. Well, it's yeah. Can't there's be pulled apart, but it yeah but it was. <laughs> it, yeah, it was like yeah, my essence of everything was just simply being pulled into pieces, becoming just, naked. Yeah, like all of my structure that 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 was there was just dissipating, and it was sort of rejoining, like. Mm. You know, it's almost as if the, the entire universe exists as this, this perfect sphere and you just crimp off a little piece and you pull it away and then it can be Adam. It can be a dog. It can be whatever. And then the twist in the on the conclusion, yeah, 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 it just joins back and then it's back to being this unbroken, perfect thing. And I just, it always has been. Again, I'm, so, I don't, I'm not just saying this. What a gift you are. It's such a nice... Because as I'm hearing it, and I know people listening are just like, you know what I mean? That's you well, should it's say also on, funny on too, your though, like, on like your resume. I give people. This episode is brought to us by our friends at Element LMNT. As you can see here on my hat, healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's not 1951 anymore. We know so much more. It's about water plus electrolytes, which makes sense. You sweat out both water and sodium when you work out, when you exercise, and generally just when you move. And both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches, energy dips, and even mental fog. But most people only replace the water well, Element is here to help. It is a huge part of my wellness program and part of my morning routine that I sincerely look forward to because not only is it delicious, but it floods your body with everything it needs for optimum hydration with zero sugar. Zero sugar, an amazing taste. It's flooding you with sodium, potassium, and magnesium for health, performance, and energy. I heard about that from Dr. Huberman to drink salt water in the morning talked about element i got on board and it makes me feel amazing and ready to go and honestly if i do exercise or walk the dog and come back and have an element it rushes my body and feels so good to replenish all of that stuff 
that I lost along the way. So it tastes amazing. I love watermelon salt is my favorite. They also make a mango chili, which is spicy, which I really, really love. And the chocolate salt and all of the chocolate flavors are amazing and really amazing hot as well, which I sometimes have at night as a replenishing treat. Element came up with a fantastic offer for us. Just go to drinklmnt.com slash weird and use promo code weird at checkout to get a free Element sample pack with any order when you order, which is great because you can try all these flavors I'm talking about. And if Element doesn't exceed your expectations, they have a no questions asked refund policy. You don't even have to send it back. So support your body, support this show. Go to drinklmnt.com slash weird to get your free sample pack with any purchase. That's drinklmnt.com slash weird and get that free sample pack and get it in your life. Support your body, support the show. We're also brought to us by our friends at Next Evo Naturals. You guys know I love CBD and Next Evo has taken it up a serious notch. So many people like, want to try CBD, but they say the same things. They don't know how much to take and they don't normally feel it because a lot of times you're not getting what is on the label. Well, spring is a perfect time to give it another go and Next Evo is here to refresh your life and eliminate those things that don't work for you, like maybe that old CBD brand. With Next Evo Natural CBD products, oil-based CBD can be one of the things that hit the bricks as you do your own personal spring cleaning. Oil-based CBD doesn't mix well with our water-based bodies, so you absorb as little as 6% of the CBD on the label. Next Evo Naturals developed a clinically tested water-soluble form of CBD, and their gummies and capsules are proven to work faster and absorb four times better than oil-based products, which means you can get the dose right and you feel it right away. I can attest to that. Their stress gummies are a game changer. It has ashwagandha, which is an adaptogen, and just the right dose of CBD. I take two of those and 15 minutes later, I'm dissolving, I'm easing into what I have to do. It doesn't take me out of the game, it just helps me merge with those things I need to do. So Next Evo developed this clinically tested water for you, water soluble form of CBD, 30 times better absorption in the first 10 minutes. Find new ways to use CBD with convenient options like gummies, capsules, dissolvable powders, which I sometimes add to my smoothies, and even creams that help speed your recovery after workouts. Give your life a refresh with the most effective and fast-acting CBD from Next Evo Naturals. For a limited time in April, get 60% off any order of $40 or more by using code WEIRD at nextevo.com. That's 60% off any order of $40 or more only in April at nextevo.com with promo code WEIRD. All right, everybody, back to it. You know? Well, it, it is vaguely funny. Like, you know, I'll do an interview for some with somebody and they'll be about the near death and just tie in psychedelics because I, I think that it has to be tied together. Mm. And, and it's weird how people have this incapability of acknowledging that psychedelics can be somehow associated with a near death experience and be mystical because one is for tripping out and at a fucking music conference or music. Yeah. Yeah festival and the tool. other and, yeah <laughs> well, these things can, are not congruent and you're like no but they are you know what yeah. i mean they're they're entirely congruent with one another mm. and I'll, I'll sometimes i'll go and i'll read the comments after i do an interview because i find it funny and people are just freaking out and you know what mm. i mean and they're mm -hmm. I, I don't like how he described this and i don't like how to describe this and i, I almost find it entertaining in a sense mm. where i'm like wow it's it's so unique how people want something to be a certain way Mm. for it to make sense to them and not what suggest that what i'm saying is uh i think a lot of some people want it to be more anthropomorphic they want to see someone in a robe they want something that's more physical like how how are you not you much like we had discussed before i think you know what i mean this, like the, the, yeah somebody really it was a little haunting at the time at the time i first heard it but they were like whatever your anthropomorphic image is let's say it's jesus they walk you up the mountain that and and then at the last kind of step they go you have to go up to the peak and when you go up to the peak i forget which mystic said this they're like and then jesus isn't even isn't even there i'm not saying that to put it down yeah meaning yeah. nothing is there you're not even there there's a sort of there is a disappointment i say this all the time but trunkpa rinpoche said enlightenment is the ego's ultimate disappointment and yeah. there is something where you're like but I want it to be me at an Applebee's and everything's free. Yeah. And I want Adam to be there. How cool would that be? 
But the paradox is, and we already said this, and I want to see if you agree, you know, Jesus isn't there, Adam isn't there, and and yet the truest thing that Adam was and the truest thing that Christ was is there, but you have to get over your desire. It's like, I, I can feel Richard Rohr saying, it's like, you go to Cleveland, but the signpost that said Cleveland is this way isn't in Cleveland because it's Cleveland. Yeah, you know what it's I mean? outside of it. Yeah. And, the, and the signpost was your your images that transformed you. But once you're transformed, those things are gone. Ramana Maharshi said, like, the the you're stoking the fire of your awareness with a stick. And the last step is you throw the stick that you're stoking the fire with in the fire because you don't need it anymore. And that's very naked yeah. and that's very voidy. That's very dowy. And we don't really like it. And that's okay. It's okay to say, I don't really like that. But when you say I was there and it was okay and you can trust it, that's a beautiful message to bring back. Yeah, I think so too. And I think like one of the biggest problems with describing any of this is like language has developed to describe the things around us. You know what I mean? In the moment mm -hmm. you start getting a little bit more esoteric with like, you know, 7 billion stars. I kind of get that, but I don't fucking know what that means. I can't picture 7 billion anything. You know, you, you start talking about, <laughs> you know, quantum level fluctuations and vibrations and frequencies. It's like, I, I kind of get it, but I don't because I have not evolved to really understand that. Yeah. And so when you, when you take language and you start talking about what we're talking about right now, you almost take something that's so expansive and you sort of put it in a box. And say, here, I just described this. Look inside this box to what I described. And again, that's the only way you can necessarily relay it. I, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. But it is inherently minimizing to discuss it. Like I and objectifying. No one, You're turning yeah. an objectlistic experience and an identityless experience to a story from the perspective of Adam. Yeah. With things that you were seeing. But you and I both know, like. Like, again, on my ketamine trip, I was like, I can see awareness. Like, I don't know how I'm doing that, but I can see it. And I was like, I've done it enough that I come back and I don't even try to describe it. I don't even really tell anybody. No. And, and I always tell people when they're coming out of a psychedelic experience, like, don't, don't feel obligated to talk about it. Yeah. Don't try and explain it. Don't try and put it in a box. Don't try and rationalize it. Just be with the experience. Because otherwise, and I saw you doing this with your near-death experience, Otherwise, it becomes an object. It becomes another object. Yeah, in a in an it, Amazon it be Prime becomes, box. Becomes right. Yeah, it becomes a, a somewhat rationalized story that then I tuck away, and it's like, but it's not that. It wasn't that. It never was that. Yeah, you yeah. know, like a five meo experience is not something that you can just take and put in a box and put aside to tell someone else. It's a completely viscerally experienced. Yeah emotional state of being well tell me what i get comfort in is i go the reality of the divine or the reality of capital r reality does not hinge on my ability to explain it or even no, remember it doesn't give a shit <laughs> that, that <laughs> but that's the great comfort so i think about this all the time let's say I, i'm dying hopefully i'm an old man and i'm dying hmm. i'm gonna i'm gonna be in a bad mood my body is going to be failing. I, I mean, yeah. there might be other things. I'm going to be aches and pains. I might yes. have cancer. My yes. knees are gone. And I, you can't you know, say, don't worry, a, a better. there's a better tomorrow. You don't have a compelling future. You're like, this is it. So there's a very good chance. And I'm trying to reconcile this now and have compassion for this now and go like, fine. Be fucking mad. Be sad. Be hopeless. Do it. Have the human experience. Because to your point earlier, you're being flooded with all sorts of hormones and stuff that are telling you, don't die. So you're fucking <laughs> yeah. in a, a stress situation. Yeah, like but a flight even if, flight response. But even if I don't have a beautiful death, ultimate reality doesn't give a shit. No, it because doesn't. Because it will like... catch you. It was you. It and, and, and it's okay. But it doesn't, you don't need to die smiling. You didn't die smiling. No, I, I died a traumatic <laughs> death and an agonizing pain. It burned yeah. my finger off. Like, yeah. you know what I oh, mean? Like, wow. it, it wasn't a super pleasant way to die. Not, I don't know what would be, yeah. but perhaps in my sleep, calm. Like, I don't know. You know what? I would actually want to see death coming. Now, after my experience with being temporarily dead or in the process of dying, 
because let's be realistic if i had died we wouldn't be having this conversation yeah i i'm almost in a weird way kind of looking forward to it to embracing it to seeing it coming and being like all right let's do this yeah let's go as gracefully into the night as we possibly can and and again yeah. like i'm not looking for it like i'm, I'm a father i have a son coming next month oh, like i got guys. yeah i know it's awesome i got stuff i gotta do i gotta be a parent and be the best parent that i can and to me death is inevitable and regardless of when that ticket get punched because at the end of the day it's fucking super dangerous being alive you know yeah. what I mean? Like it, it, and that sounds like such a stupid statement, but no, you know, people, we're, we're dandelions like, yeah. in the sidewalk cracks. We are. Yeah. There does like a botanist who described the Amazon as just the sea of absolute chaotic murder. Mm. And, and I find it funny because I'm like, yeah, that, that is life. That, that is not just the Amazon. That is every single thing that we exist around is, is a series of just chaoticness. Yeah. And there's organization within it, but man, I, I could, finish this conversation off, go to pick up my daughter, get clipped by someone running the light. Yeah. You know, I could, uh, all the multitude of damage I've done to my body, I can get cancer. I can have this. I just read a statistic that two people a day in LA, something like two, two to four get hit by a car. I'm just like, can't we figure that out? Like we haven't figured out. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, unfortunately, I think we figured out how to be completely distracted all the time, and we've perfected that shit. Well, that's num 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 yeah. num 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 num. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not even judging it. I num num all the time because sometimes you get a little overwhelmed. Yeah, you know, and, and and so do I. But it is an interesting thing to note that, like, you know, it seems that with the internet and this notions of social media and this global connection that we we've, we've never really been more connected, but yet we've never been more isolated simultaneously. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, we we elect for this plethora of communications, relatively superficial, perhaps, over physical contact with people in our community and around us. Mm-hmm. And I, I sometimes wonder what that's doing to us as as a whole. You know what I mean? Like I do, and I, I'm always I have a little blind optimism where I'm like, it sorts itself out. I'm I'm always just trying to look at the past, and I'm like, yeah. And they thought umbrellas were weird, and and it 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 worked out. You know what I mean? Like the Amazon, <laughs> the Amazon has achieved amidst all of that murder, a certain equilibrium and it, and look at it, it it's, it's murder. And it's also very lush and it it's adaptable and it's, and it's, you know, and so are we. Well, and the second side to that too, is like, you know, there's been, and okay, I, I say this in the best possible way. This is just my thought processes on this is like, you know, we don't really have to exist. There, There is going to be at some point in time when humanity doesn't exist for a variety of different reasons, whether we just all grow it or like just completely evolve into something else or, yeah. you know, you know, biological consciousness ceases to be relevant and we have artificial consciousness that seem to be taking the role, the torch up. You know, there's nothing that suggests that we need to exist. Mm. You know, we've had multiple extinction events on this planet. And so at the same time, there's like this dual sort of mentality that I have where it's like everything will simply be what it needs to be. Yeah. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually be at least trying to figure out ways around the problems that we experience, because that's what separates us from the dinosaurs that we have the capacity to act. Yeah. And, you know, and and I look at social isolation and I look at the, the culture and the generation that is emerging now and wonder like, you know, what state of mind are they in to grapple with the problems that we're going to be experiencing over the mm. course of the next couple of generations? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. When you think about it as God's dream, you're like, God can dream whatever God wants to dream. It doesn't fucking matter. Like we, and again, yeah. it's it's hard not to be like, we're the chosen ones. But it's like, well, we're yeah. not. We're well, just an expression. Right. Yes. That's, that's, and this is what I mean when I'm like, we don't really like it, but that's why I, I have to anthropomorphize. I have to add emotion and heart to it and be like, it's you, you're playing it. It's your dance. You can't go anywhere. Pete can leave. Adam can leave. But what you ultimately are, whatever game is being played, it'll be you playing it. And I I, I know that yeah. sounds kind of egoic. And that goes back to what goes wrong with cults. If Pete yeah. is like, it'll be Pete that's playing it. That's not what I'm saying. It'll be the essence of Every single one of us is this one thing and it's the only game in town. And if it's dreaming a world that's all AIs walking around on like those bouncy sort of legs, <laughs> yeah. that go on, fine. Then that's sure. fine. Yeah. 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 So what happened? You start to 
evaporate and then and then you came back they yeah defibrillated so, like, you or something i got defibrillated twice and so i was in a ventricular fibrillation arrhythmia which is basically just your heart spasming and and they put the pads on me defibrillated me and so i was like merging with the universe in this beautiful state of awareness and then all of a sudden i started being electrocuted again and a defibrillation takes like 0.5 seconds but this seemed like this prolonged period of electrocution hmm. and then all of a sudden i just like snap back to being fuck i'm adam i'm dead i'm in outer space hmm. without a body hmm. i am like just this trapped consciousness and i'm like huh i'm like okay here we are and, it, and you know we are so I, I'm also a paramedic. So the cycles are two minutes of CPR, then analysis and defibrillation. So it would have been two minutes between the shocks. Mm. But it was like, I wouldn't say an eternity, but it was a very long time of just being Adam in this space. Outside like of coming, time. Yeah. Yeah. Like coming to terms with myself and my existence and who and what I thought I was. Mm. Wow. And then I started being electrocuted again, which was the second defibrillation. And then... I don't know. I, I think maybe I had some awareness of being pulled or sucked or something. Mm. And I was like, I think I was cognitively aware I was back in my body and I was in a coma for like maybe seven hours or something. Oh. And then I woke up in the ICU and I was intubated and I had like an interosseous drilled into my shoulder bone and my right. family's there and everyone, you know, they kind of thought I was brain dead. So it was, it was good that I was like smiling. I'm like, ah, and you know, I, I knew what had happened. I was, it was just, it was like one continuous experience. You know what I mean? There wasn't really much separation to it. And so after they, I remember after they extubated me, one of the first things I said was like, how long has it been? You know what I mean? Like part of like my hands were all bandaged. And I think I was like trying to feel my face for like a beard or something. Like if someone yeah. had said it's, it's been 15 years, I've been like, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Adam, that's fair. the, those are the first words out of my mouth after my five MEO. I go, how long? I know, right? Yeah. How long was that? Because you know, time is a is a concept that we've developed to go like between events, you know, like and we yeah, measure it's, it's it. organized structure. You know what I mean? Like yeah. five minutes, ten minutes. This is how long this has been, durations. It's and when you're outside of that, and again, we experience that with deep sleep, a sense of timelessness. Yeah. So it's not as far out as it sounds. But I I know what you mean. I when when you go like like you, you do a, a strong psychedelic and you're like, time doesn't exist. It's eternal, which isn't forever. It doesn't mean an infinite amount of time. It means the absence of time. Yeah, there's a very big difference between those a things. huge yeah. difference. Because I was like, I don't want to be stuck. Nobody wants to be Han Solo in the carbonite and just like no. watching the clock. Yeah. But there is no clock. So it's like there's no you, which sounds like death, but it's a relief. There's no time, which sounds like being stuck in amber, like a mosquito in amber, but it's a relief. It's all of these things that we're so afraid of. I think that's what's wonderful about this conversation is you're like, you can trust yourself. You yeah, can trust you can, what you are. You can just assume that what is going to happen is okay. And, and even for me, like I remember, you know, like I... <laughs> I like walked out of the ICU like four hours after that. I'm like, I'm fucking out of here. Hmm. And so I had the burns and everything. And I remember just being like so hyper aware of like my breathing, like every hmm. breath. I'm like, oh yeah, one of those. And I like my smell, you know, like we're, we're, we're primates. Like we stink. We have yeah, this natural yeah. olfactoriness. We communicate and, and don't get me wrong. I just had a very traumatic experience. I'm sure I had released some pheromones, Yeah, but I was so hyper aware of my skin and my smell and I remember yeah. just being like, I just got downgraded from like a Cray supercomputer to like a Commodore 2000, like yes. 16 bit. And it was this like, is, yes, yeah. And it was, it was like not difficult, but it was very, very, very much something that I was like working through was, and I remember being like, I mean, this is a fucking meat suit prison. Like it was, yeah. I was almost like I was, I had expanded to everything and was now trapped in this, you know, relatively flawed frail yeah you know simian primate body running around peeing yeah. and pooping and stuff meat puppet this yeah uh well ramdas's story about uh death is completely safe it's like taking off a tight shoe so you had taken off the tight shoe and you expanded then you were put back in the shoe it also and the shoe me, felt really tight <laughs> yeah it's a tight I mean, shoe yeah, it's it a tight straining i haven't had what you had but i've taken off the shoe and you're like well, and then, see, that's what's weird. Like, I've yeah. done 5-MEO 
many times. Mm. I think five MEO is the, and a lot of people disagree with this, but I think it would be any psychonauts eventual journey would be to five MEO DMT. Mm. That's just my opinion, and feel free to disagree with that. You mean you think but, it's the it's the top of the mountain? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I well, and actually, interestingly enough, a friend of mine, he's sort of a neurobiologist, and you know, all these other psychedelics, they they create a space in your consciousness and they sort of texture it. You know, like psilocybin, and you create the space in your consciousness, and you texture it with psilocybin, which gives a psilocybin experience. Where five meo is just space; there's nothing there to be textured. Yeah. It just simply creating a void of pure consciousness in your brain. Yeah. And so do it's you, like, well, well, do I need the texture? Yes, it's textureless. I didn't understand yeah. what a non-visual psychedelic was. Because I was like, what do you mean you don't see anything? And I'm also curious, when I did it, I remember Pete's last thought. Because there is a last thought. You've done it a bunch of times. I've only done it once. But it's like you're being sucked like a... Like kind of like what you said when you were going back to your body, yeah. like stuck out of your body. And I remember thinking, here we go. This is what you've been so afraid of. That was yeah. my last thought. Well, it even I'm I'm still always like a little bit apprehensive going of course, in. Of course. And then the moment I come out, I'm like, that was perfect. Yeah. That was that was exactly what I needed to experience in that moment. You know, mm. that that is exactly what I needed. And it, it's always that. But there's always a, that interesting apprehension because it's sort of this self-preservation instinct. Of course. And I, I tell myself, I go, um, Pete, my personality, my ego, whatever you want to say, will never think it's a good idea to annihilate Pete. No, but there's no. a There's yeah. a higher functioning, there's an other, there's a naked witness to Pete that I also am, and it loves it. <laughs> yeah and, and that's an interesting thing is like over time like you know 5-MeO DMT very conveniently is not scheduled in Canada like you can buy pens on the internet and there's really? no legality associated with it yeah hmm. now that that could change you never know because it's gaining popularity but because I think part of the reason is so obscure there's just never been any move towards scheduling it mm. so you can order it online there's no real issue associated with that hmm. which is which is actually really nice in Canada and so I wouldn't say that there's thriving communities of people who do 5-MeO DMT but it's it's kind of getting quite popular. And I do think that after Mike Tyson sort of started talking about it, people were like, wait, what, what is this substance that yeah. I've never heard of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and more often than not, people are like, oh, it's DMT. So it's the same as DMT. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, That's they interesting. Are so profoundly different. But as someone who's done 5 MEO but never done NN DMT, and like, I am, I feel like I just hear people tell stories about, like, I think of my friend, I won't say his name, he wouldn't care, but. He smoked five. Uh, he smoked NNDMT, which I always call Buck mm. Rogers. It's like jumping into a, a black hole. I've never done it, yeah. but it's a little more sci-fi. Again, you you tell me. Yeah, but it's oh, like an, it's an adventure. I'm going to go and I'm going to do something. I might be a Native American, and I might live. I had a friend who said he lived an entire life as a Native American. He had a wife. He was a hunter. There were days and nights and he slept and, and then he came out of it and he was like, oh, that was a drug experience. So he that's one of Shane's arguments for it, by the way. He's like, when I die, I'll know I'll have lived hundreds of, of lives, basically. I've had way more experience than than anybody. But I get scared. And, and Doug, uh, his name is Doug, who cares? Doug's experience was, wasn't frightening or anything. But he was just like in a crab, in a coliseum, and he was operating the crab, and he was fighting another crab. Like for thousands of people watching this crab battle royale, and they're fighting. And I was like, did you win? He was like, yeah, I won. It, it was kind of, it was a lot, but it was intense. It was very real, and it was, it was frightening and adrenalizing and all these things. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be in a crab. But then I talked to other people about it. <laughs> I don't want to be in a crab. I don't want to be in a crab. And I also go like, as a spiritual person, I do psychedelics as my spiritual practice. I'm like, what is gained from that? But but tell me why, why if you like NNDMT and, and maybe an experience that you had that... I don't. Oh, you don't? So, no, like I, I've done it. I remember I this was like years ago, like probably eight or nine years ago. And 
I didn't even know what 5-MeO DMT was at this point. And a friend of mine was talking about NNDMT and she had some and here you go. And so we're just trying and like pursuing moving forward with it. And I wasn't hitting that threshold point. And so I ended up doing like 90 milligrams of NNDMT in two separate doses, sequential back to back. Smoking it? Yeah, vaporizing it. And so just completely annihilated myself. And it was like I was being you know, projected through all these dimensional spaces and one to the next to the next. And finally just merged in this area. And there was these like fractal entities that were just raw intelligence. Mm. And I remember like focusing on them and not saying, but focusing this thought was like, I want to know the meaning of it all. And they kind of like moved me into this other dimensional space. And it was just like, the entire universe was this child's toy of these super intelligent, omnipresent beings that exist outside the fabric of reality. And I was just kind of sitting there and I'm like, but I could almost hear the laughter where I'm like, it wasn't laughter, but I could hear that them just laughing at me for that's what it, I, I came all this way to this place. And that's what I wanted to know. Something that was so glaringly obvious to them, but irrelevant for me. Mm. And they're like, yeah, here you go. Here's, here's something. And then it was like this one time loop after another coming out of it. And it was actually kind of alarming, you know, just, it was like being this fractal. And when you become the fractal, there's no end to it. Mm. And it was almost just like experiencing infinity in this perfect movement of fractalization. And I just, I just was this fractal. Yeah. And then when I came out of it, I'm like, oh, fuck, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah. And it kind of like, turned me off it. I haven't really wanted to experience much with it since. Mm. Yeah. I mean, even what you told me, it's like when I hear these accounts of it's it, like DMT's sense of humor and its sense of mischief and like the elves, like you're you're talking about fractal beings, but this like elfish sort of like show them the toy, you know, yeah. like show them the <laughs> yeah. child's toy. And I'm like, there's almost like a comedy to it that I'm like, I don't like pranks <laughs> like i don't yeah, i don't, you know don't I mean? want to like, be pranked I, yeah <laughs> like i don't do psychedelics because i want to be entertained if mm. that makes sense like i'm not doing this for recreation i'm doing this because once i found out that i could be better mm. i'm like well why not why not pursue and overcome my insecurities why not pursue and overcome my fears and my inadequacies and all these things that just make me difficult to be with it's and you know, it's like, helped you do yeah. that in the human plane. Like it's improved your oh, life. Oh God, yeah. Like mm. you know, I I feel like now more often than not. And again, too, like be weary of people who claim enlightenment. You know, I I've always said that. It's just I just feel better about everything. Mm. You know, my my capacity to love my daughter is is without conditions. It's without my own insecurities preventing me from doing so. I just just want to love that kid i just yeah. want to be better for the world around me i want to be better for my relationship with my wife mm. and i feel like before i wasn't that person before i was caught up with how do i get ahead how do i get the one up in this relationship how do mm. i meander and, and move a conversation or an argument so that i have the upper hand as opposed to just simply being like hey i'm wrong i'm sorry let's mm. figure out a way through this mm. and you know, a lot of people have asked me like, oh, after your near-death experience, have you been telepathic or you control shit with your mind? And I'm like, no, I'm not fucking at all. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've never mm. been had that capacity. It would be lovely, but I don't. And that's not my goal in any of this. It's not to get things that are external to me. It's to simply be better with who and what I am and accept that mm. and and work with myself to be better. That, you're reminding me again of my 5-MEO thing some of the people I was with were like, oh, you had a the Jesus experience m l less than the Christ experience. So the Christ experience would be like, it's all, ah, it's all one. It's all that would, it, it, it's, it's hard to talk about the Christ experience, but it's just like unity of consciousness, yeah. ultimate love void, content void, all that stuff. Mine, when I came back, I kept going, it matters. Like this matters, what we do, what we say, what we read, what we think about, it's beautiful. Like I didn't have the like, it's irrelevant feeling. I was like, this yeah. is gorgeous that we are away from home and that we're still in love with home and still want to bring that into this place is beautiful. 
like that 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 was one of the things that i got from it and the big nothing the big content loving nothing but also like love matters friendship matters like, yeah it does all this you stuff know, matters it, and it, it's difficult when you're talking about psychedelics specifically by the dmt because it's by its very nature is full of contradictions mm. And and you have a conversation as the conversation ebbs and flow in different components of it, it is inevitable that you will contradict yourself at some point in time. Mm. Because, you know, everything and nothing, you know, like everything, the entire universe in a single point of perfection is how I would describe yes. like a perfect five email meal experience. Yes. You know, like, well, that by its very nature is contradictory. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's so it's well, I would even say it matters and it doesn't matter. Like, I have to say that. Like, that's, that's what it I mean. absolutely like, doesn't yeah. matter. Like, But it does. <laughs> and it, but <laughs> but I mean? it yeah. does. And all of the mystics, all like I'm thinking of James Finley. I talked to him about this where I was like, but perfect oneness doesn't even know about Pete. How could oneness know about a separate? And And he was like, I hear you. And I'm like, but does it love Pete? And it's like, yes. But does it know about Pete? Like we start thinking about how could oneness know about another? Both. It's all, this is Richard Rohr. Yeah. Mysticism is always both and. It's always yeah. both and. And it's always paradox. And it always falls apart when we talk about it. And yeah, and and people don't like that. You know what I mean? They, yeah. they want complete answers. They want a, a faith that, that gives them divinity in front of them that they can worship. And, and I think that's even just part of our very nature is that we want to bring things down we want to anthropomorphize we want to view things from our own lens well, we want to have it and yeah, honestly and i get dude, that fair enough I, yeah. talk about leveraging a relationship if i'm being real i want to have it because i want to be special because i have it you know what i mean yeah. like you do these things and your your pursuit can be noble you know how many stories are it's like the pure of heart can pass through but who there is a part cares, though you know like i agree I, I, i'm not yeah, hard on I, pete yeah i'm not I don't hard on believe him that altruism next necessarily like necessarily exists you know mm. i do things because it makes me feel good mm. but the more you get out of your own way then the things you're doing to make you feel good are inherently good mm. if i get away from my own insecurities and i get away from my own hang-ups and all the issues that i have which we all are full of them the more simply just being good and healthy and loving yourself, which therefore allows you to love everything around you, the better off that you are. Mm. Like, you know, anger and hate and fear, like they're easy emotions to, to feel. You know what I mean? Like anger is a lot easier than feeling insecure or feeling ashamed. So anger is one of those things where you're like, you know what? It's just easier. It doesn't make me feel bad. I can just be fucking mad all the you're time. You're so right. You're not sad. You're pissed. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're you're sad. I tried to yeah. do that on stage. I was like, Eminem is so sad. I'm I, I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing. I'm just like, it's just so easy to be like, fuck you, I'm gonna shoot you, or whatever it is. And you're like, really, right under that colorful candy shell is just a beautiful, open hearted, like, oh yeah, I'm so sad. You know, his father is not there. He got raised yeah. by his mom. There was hardship. There was abandonment issues. There was right. all this kind of shit and growing up in poverty and yeah. and yeah. feelings of self worth. Like you know, I'm not going to analyze the man necessarily, but, but yeah, it was, that was yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. But that's We're us all, too. Yeah. When it's when I get angry, I go like I'm either embarrassed or sad, humiliated. I have shame. But it, it, the first one that comes out is always fuck that person, fucking idiot, fuck you, fuck that. Like yeah. it's just like that. It's like easy. It's, easy it's an yeah. easier emotion to feel than those things but they're still present and i find like that's kind of what a psychedelic journey is about is mm. just getting to the reasons why i am shameful about something why mm. why is it that i feel shame about it who fucking cares mm. what we all do you know what i mean like it's it's amazing because we, we are a profoundly social mammal are the reason why we become this apex species on this planet is because we can cooperate together in large groups with abstract ideas that we can bind one another with and go on a fucking crusade or build a tower or whatever mm. you know us being friendly with one another and having relationships is integrally important to our survival mm -hmm. you know much like an ant it, it wanders away it's fucking gonna die yeah. These are all, you know, a beast strays away from the colony. It dies. Yeah. You know, we are not all that different. And so we have all of these biological imperatives to be like, to have hierarchical structures within a group, to work together, to be friends. And 
within that becomes these interesting paradoxical issues of like shame and fear and not fitting in and humiliation and all these mm -hmm. things like you think a fucking snow leopard by itself out in the mountain gives a sweet shit what anyone thinks about it of course not <laughs> but you get into these social structures where it's like you know for millions of years my survival really was paramount to the group that i exist in yeah. and we all have to get along we all have to work together we all have to be friendly yeah and shame is a very significant motivating factor to keep you in line you know wow. like it, it makes sense from an evolutionary yeah. perspective but it's like but it's also highly destructive but these are lights that were turned on by your experiences they were enhanced yeah. by your experiences do you remember is there a 5 meo is it the same stuff we've been talking about or is there something we're leaving on the table like the times you've done it i feel like you know it's funny every time i like used to be doing 5 meo it was almost like this new experience and it was like the most profound experience that i've ever had in my life and but so was the one before that and the one before that and the one before that hmm. and it almost just became sort of this idea that each experience is sort of like completing this massive puzzle like this jigsaw puzzle and at the very beginning of completing a puzzle you're like i don't know there's some white shit over here there's some blue stuff maybe that's water i don't know but then as you're assembling it, you'd be like, okay, that's the cloud escape right there. There's a tip of a mountain. Like you start to become aware of what you're assembling. Mm. And I feel that with 5MEO, like you're over time, you're just assembling this multidimensional puzzle that is yourself. Mm. Wow. You know what I mean? Like so you're, it's building, you're, it's building on it. You're oh, not just going back and eating another piece of cake. It's like, it's going, there's a story to it. To me, it, it that's what it seems like. And and again, too, this is my subjective experience as Adam. Like, I don't know. Yeah. But it does seem that I'm just creating this this puzzle that this is multi-dimensional, highly complex emotional creature that is myself and just completely understanding what that puzzle is. Because I don't think really anyone knows themselves. Mm. And that's what this is. It's like it's know myself. Mm. Truly know who and what I am at the core of my being. Mm. leave no stone unturned you know split every single piece of wood find what i am and mm. acknowledge it and accept it wow. and it's turning out to be profoundly difficult but but the more but, you do it to yourself the more you can do it to others that that's been a big lesson of my life is like if you want to be forgiven forgive other people and if yeah. you want to be loved love other people and and giving is receiving and the illusion of i'm giving you respect and then i get this feeling of respect you know like i'm not talking about you're showing me respect it's just giving is receiving i don't know how else to put it it, it sounds no, like that's, a it's, it's a reasonable way like you know people always look for external validation and and we're taught that you know what i mean i i'm taught that like if i buy a lincoln navigator matthew mcconaughey tells me that i'll uh, that i'll find this this will identify me and i will become myself or mm this cream or lotion is going to make me more attractive. Like everything is we're taught is external to us in this system. Mm -hmm. And by purchasing and perpetuating this capitalist system, which fair enough, that's the system we have. I am going to be whole again. It's like this notion of materialism filling a void within myself. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the, the only way that you will ever fill that void is going inside and figuring out why the fuck that void is there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And more than likely, there's a million different reasons, all, all complicatedly mixed together, contributing to this sense of loneliness or loss or mm -hmm. insecurity or whatever it is that people have. But we, you know, our entire advertising system is somewhat based on the fact that we all have this. We that all you're have not enough. Yeah. 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 Wow. So you're getting like a lot of psychological value out of these things. It's not just metaphysical or like deep spiritual things. You're you're figuring out Adam. Well, it's both, right? Like it's I, I don't see how any of those couldn't be connected with one another. You know, mm. like mm. you you look at all these philosophies that, you know, these esoteric philosophies, they they all come back down and pertain from the same psychological base that created them. Mm. You know what I mean? Like these wild philosophizing mystics they still have the same psychology and biology that we all share. It's just an extension of that. It's just bringing it back down and being like, okay, let, let's hash this shit out. Hmm. You know, why do I feel this way? And you have a psychedelic experience and you meander through this minefield of madness inside you and you've sorted out. And Can then, you share, is there a, a breakthrough that you're comfortable sharing as an example? You know, it's hard to... It's hard to separate a tree from the forest in this, mm. if you know what I mean. Like, 
you know, I, I can say that my first psychedelic experience as an adult was at Boga. And, you know, I'd been a paramedic for 10 years at the time. You know, I've been doing this for probably over over a decade, psychedelics. And I, I had done like mushrooms as a teenager and everything. And but you know, you become an adult and I'm like, ah, I need to give this the hee ho. I'll just stick with numbing my emotions with booze. <laughs> and you become a paramedic and there's like sort of an egotistical association with that. And I, I know a friend of mine, he had gotten addicted addicted to opioids at a fairly young age. This was back, you know, when in the nineties and two thousands when he just, oh, here's seven thousand oxycodone, good luck with your with your life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so he was very addicted and he you know, it was destroying his life. He was getting suicidal. And he went to Mexico and did Iboga. And he had this big, powerful experience, completely caused the cessation of his addiction, made him profoundly spiritual. Is that and the one that, that can kill you, Iboga? I've yes. never done Yeah, I haven't done yes, that one. Is. But it's like very, vi it's not well, violent, but it's not pleasant. It's not like a... No, no, it was it was dark and gritty. And then the reason why it has such a negative connotation is because it's predominantly used with people with you know, 10, 20 year poly drug use addictions. Mm. And chances are after 20 years of being a poly drug user, you have some health problems. Mm. You're, you're probably not about to run a triathlon. Mm. You know what I mean? You, you could have a variety of communicable diseases. You could have cardiac damage, your liver damage. Like, yeah. And so people will go into these flood doses and for a variety of different reasons, you can have prolonged Q2 period, which is the bottom and uh, top part of your heart space their beats out. Mm. You can have liver issues because it's metabolized in your liver. And so there's a very negative association with it, but it's because it has been predominantly used to treat people with very significant addictions. Mm, and at I the see. end of the day, if you go through the appropriate screening, I, I don't think that there's a significant high mortality to it. But I also will note that of the psychedelics, you know, Iboga is really the only one that has these concerns with it. Like psilocybin, you can eat... Is it half your body weight in dried mushroom material before you even achieve an LD50, which is <laughs> half the people who consume that will die. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's a profoundly safe thing. But so anyways, so he had done Iboga. He wants to share it with people. It was legal in Canada at the time. It's still not necessarily illegal. And so he wanted me to help him because of the concerns that we just discussed. And I was like, I kind of feel like I should try this. And I, I was like, I, at the time, I had like crippling back pain. I had problems peeing, which was funny. Like I'd stand there and like, you know, bouncing and turning the tap on. And my, mm. my, my wife at the time was like, do you have prostate issues? And I'm like, mm. I don't know. Like I'm like in my mid thirties right now, early thirties. Mm. And so one thing led to another and I ended up doing like a, a solid, solid dose of Iboga. And it was like you say, it was dark. It was scary. I remember at one point there was like, I was in the room and you make everything absolutely pitch black because you get very sensitive to light. So there was like, you know, I hate to say this, but there's like garbage bags on the windows. Mm. I'm sitting absolute pitch black and I can't see anything. And then all of a sudden I can feel it kicking in. And then it's just like, I'm seeing a black and white movie. I can see perfectly. And all of a sudden these weird hallucinations start. And there's like these toys walking around on my legs and bats flying around the ceiling. I'm like, what in the fuck is going on? Mm. And then it just pushed into me. And I started seeing like images from my job of like, you know, not, not specific images, but like, you know, disembodied body or dead kids and like heads ripped apart. And I remember I was trying to look away from it and this deep voice, like a masculine voice said, no, look at this. And I was like, okay. And I spent hours just going over all of these horrific things I had seen. Mm, which and, had to have been traumatic for you. And it wanted you to face it. Is that what it felt like? Well, I, I knew that whatever was happening, I, I trusted it. Like this didn't seem malicious. Like nothing was enjoying making me feel this way. It just felt like I needed to do this. And as the experience sort of was like coming to a conclusion, like it had, you know, tricked me that I had, was going to die. And I was like coming to terms with my own self-destructive behavior and drinking and all this crazy shit was happening. And once I sort of accepted it all, it was like, you know, the curtain came up. I was completely out of the experience. And I'm like, holy shit. And I'm like, what? Is, like this, this was like 14 hours. Hmm. And, you know, I could feel all these little vibrations in my pelvis and like my back pain went away. I've never had back pain since. I've never had problems urinating since. Hmm. And to me, that entire experience was like all of these memories that I had of all these relatively horrible things was like dirty, wet laundry that I'd thrown in the corner, like in a hamper. 
over the years and it was like moldy and gross and stinking and off gassing. And this experience was taking them out, washing them, drying them and putting them back in a hamper, like putting yeah. them back in the cupboard. So it was not that I needed to get rid of all this stuff. I just needed to process it. I needed yeah. to experience the shittiness that was actually going on when I wouldn't allow myself to experience that. Mm. Wow. And I felt it was almost, I felt reborn. Like I remember I was so emotional that morning and I'm like crying. I, re- I was like, had a TV on. It was like a Sarah McLaughlin commercial about stray dogs. And I'm like sobbing. And it was yeah. just, it was like something I had turned that part of me off. And now I was re-experiencing this emotional side of myself and, and, and everyone knew, saw this change in me. Like it was wild. Mm. Like, you know, my parents were like, Oh my God, like, what have you done? Like you just, yeah. your body posture, your shoulders, everything is different about you. Wow. I, it reminds me of Brian's book where it's, uh, in, um, what is it called? It doesn't matter in, in that Greek town, uh, El- Eleusis, Eleusis. Yeah. But it says uh, in the temple, it said, if you die before you die, you won't die then when you, can, you die. Yeah, yeah. And your story sounds very similar. I'm thinking, I think it's Adya Shanti had a very similar, like his enlightenment experience was I'm going to die. Like he thought he was dying and then he surrendered to it and then he didn't die and then he came back. So this is the born again kind of language that, you know, in my tradition, that that just meant that you became a Christian, but like really dying and before you die and being renewed is wow that uh, uh, there's a compound that will bring that about i believe it can well, be done I, without it but like i think it's crazy so that there I. is one yeah you know and then you get into like holotropic breathing and like wim hof and stuff where yeah yeah basically it's like breathing cycles of hyperventilating for lack of a better term and yep. then breath holding can cause a natural endogenous dmt release i did wim hof before my 5 meo and i highly recommend that because yeah, the state of my body was so flooded with oxygen and and there were like five six seven people in our group and it one thing that was very interesting was everybody had the trip that there were we had like an intention sharing kind of thing everyone hit their intention exactly right but my intention was to hang out with myself to spend time as myself with myself, but I wanted a love and light. I wanted like a positive and the breath work was me kind of priming my body, my physiology to match that. And, you know, I've I've said this before, so I'm trying not to say too snooty, but no one else in the group did the breath work. And I'm like, it (laughs) made such a difference. And to your point, the breath work just by itself can get you into those places, which is incredible. And like also achieving sometimes... mystic states over, over like it's not as if mystic states are new to us as a species yeah you know like you look at twirling dervishes and sufism and, yeah. and breathing practices of a negasadu in india and even ancient psychedelic use like achieving mystic states and weird levels of intoxication whether endogenous or exogenous has been really paired with humanity yeah. since the episode yeah. right like it's I always weird. wondered what those people standing on one leg on a pole were doing, you know, but those, those were also altered states of consciousness, like trying to force, Exertion. yeah, force the, or people that they put the hooks in their back, like in the flesh of their back and hang and bleed yeah. out for days. I'm not saying anyone should do that, but I was like, what a goofy jungle culture. And then I was like, no, these people were trying to get as close to death as they could and come back like the movie flatliners. That's, that's basically yeah, what that dude. was. The original Flyliners is such a fantastic movie. Like Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, yes. like magnificent. They they redid it, and I was like, ah, fucking disappointing. I that movie really scared me. I saw it when I was too young. I shouldn't. Yeah, have so did I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but then you lived it. So Adam, we we we've talked for two hours. I, I really appreciate your time. Obviously, this was life giving and and fascinating to me. I do want to close with just a question that only you could a- answer as a as a near death person. What do you guys call yourselves? <laughs> I I don't know. Like, you know, it's funny that I have never really went on chat groups for NDEs and people like you should read other people's experience. I'm like, why? If it's, it's irrelevant. Like I yeah. had my experience. I don't want to yeah. read Muddy about it. other people's. Yeah. And so I just don't. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I, I don't think I've ever actually listened to someone else's NDE because I don't care. Yeah. I love that. Good for you. Yeah. Here's my but question. NDEites is what I'd prefer. There you go. Yeah, yeah. If somebody came up to you, if one of the people listening came up to you and just said, 
what do people get wrong about death or what should we know about death? What, just as like a little parting word, what would you say as somebody who's, who's, I've never talked to somebody that came as close to absolute overness as you, what do people get wrong about death? Well, I, I just, again, like everything that we discussed, like death is viewed as a tragedy and fair enough. It can be in certain circumstances, but at the end of the day, like death and birth are the one thing that binds every living thing on this planet is the most natural experience that you can have. And yes, it is the end of a perceived identity, but it's not the end of you. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's so hard to remove yourself from that identity and the fear of not existing but man like i don't want to sound crazy but we're all just facets of an infinite complexity experience itself subjectively like you are god and not in a statement of ego or or an inflatedness it's just that we are literally something that will perpetuate itself for as long as it can wow it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be anything. It just simply is another transient moment in an infinite experience. Wow. So cool. <laughs> Thank you for taking <laughs> this time, man. What a, what a treat this was for me on a random Tuesday. No, it was honestly, it was really cool talking to you. And I have no idea how we burned two hours, man. That, that was a. No, I know. Yeah. Time didn't exist. It went by yeah. so fast for me. I, I was so thrilled. And you're just, I, you're, you're, you're wonderful. I really appreciate you. Um, and thank you for doing it. We have the guest say, keep it crispy. It's just to give a sense of closure. You say the catchphrase, which is keep it crispy. Is there anything you want to plug before we jump? Well, like my podcast tapped into psychedelics, you know, I'm just exploring psychedelics because I feel like there's so much misinformation. Yeah. about psychedelics and, and also expectations on psychedelics like a lot of people think that just doing mushrooms will alleviate all of your problems and it's like well no it's work yeah it's it might be efficient work it might be five years worth of therapy in a single experience but it's work you know what yeah. i mean it's grindy yeah. it can be scary if you want to feel euphoric you know maybe you should find something else yeah and <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah they're not escapist yeah. drugs they're, no, uh, they're not. They're confrontational. They're, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the podcast has been super interesting to do, just talking with scientists and doctors and philosophers and bioethicists and veterans and hmm. facilitators. And, you know, it's That's great. been, so, yeah, it's been really amazing. Tapped into psychedelics. Yeah. It's available on like Spotify and all over the place. Great. Cool. That's great, man. Well, thank you again. And would you get up, give us a keep it crispy and we'll sign off? Keep it crispy, man. You keep it crispy. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. You made it weird. You made it weird. You made it weird. Oh, yeah. You made it weird. You made it weird. You made it weird. Oh, yeah. You made it weird. You made it weird. You made it weird. Oh, yeah. You made it weird. You made it weird.